Brooks, before you moved to Hollywood, what was the picture you had in your mind of what it meant to be a working Hollywood screenwriter? That's a great question. Um, uh, if before I went to Hollywood, my thought of being a working screenwriter is um, sort of nonstop, five projects at a time, this one, that one, the other one, and um, you know, finishing one and, and getting on to another one. I mean, I think that's pretty much what I would think back, back then. So when you were at NYU or even before, you had this vision that it would be nonstop work, phone ringing, people wanting to have meetings maybe. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, the idea of made it was, um, it, what's so interesting is that a lot of people talk about, oh, have you made it, have you broke it in or whatever. Um, and it's, it's kind of amorphous when you go, well, what does that mean to you that you made it? And people usually go, screen cybers, I don't really know. So <laughs> that was certainly the case for me. I mean, when I started, um, I was making movies with my friends in high school and um, it was so much fun. And um, I just was like, look, nothing in my life is more fun than this. How can I do this as much as possible? And then I was like, oh, well, I can go to study at NYU Film School. And I went and so, and then at that point, I just, I would have probably, if I was pushed to define making it, I would have thought, yeah, making something that's widely released um, and everybody knows you and you're whatever. And, and my thought was, yeah, you're sort of working constantly. Um, that's probably how I, how I thought about it back then. In terms of the process of the work, did, did you think that it would just be as easy as sitting down and, you know, having a glass of wine or whiskey or whatever and just music in the background and it all pours out? Or did you realize that it would be more painstaking? Uh, that, that's interesting. Um, well, because the way I started um, with my friends, it was there was a social aspect of it. It was like, I wanted to do this with my friends. I liked them and we had this idea to do together and it was fun. So there was a very team oriented start to when I made movies. And then on my own, I would do my own experiments. And then as I got to film school, I learned that expressing my own voice was really powerful and satisfying in a way. So I became pretty good at um, working on other people's projects and supporting them, uh, co-writing, uh, and collaborating in groups and you know leading following and everything in between um, so the um, so the process was sort of intoxicating engaging fascinating and like layered and levels and so I um, so yeah so the, the creativity the, the creative part of it and the process always, always came pretty naturally and was deeply engrossing to me so it um, there were things that back then I would consider hard or difficult or whatever um, about the process, but it, the way I approach it now, it, it's never hard. It's, it's always easy, and it's because um, I frame it in a way that makes it easy, whereas back then I didn't know how to do that. So I was generally having fun, but very often going, wow, this is so hard, this is difficult. I was looking at the, 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 what was going on in certain ways without realizing that was undermining the power of my process. And when did you realize that it was much different than your first visions of what a working, successful Hollywood screenwriter is? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. So I, right out of NYU film school when I was 22 years old, I made a, I wrote, directed, and produced a feature. Um, and then we kind of ran out of money <laughs> and it took a couple of years to kind of get edited and, and put it out there. And I ended up taking it on this really fun um, uh, college tour because it was a college, it was a movie about my friends on the NYU soccer team and how we were pretty good at playing soccer but really good at drinking after games. Um, and that's probably a more interesting encapsulation of what it actually was. Um, but like, uh, there were some good aspects of it, but it was really kind of like a, a graduate level student feature. It was kind of, you know, we were up 22. Um, but, I, but I took that film to um, all these different college campuses on this college tour and I played it for a, for a, for a month. Uh, at the, in New York City at this off-off Broadway space called New York City's Guerrilla Cinema that we created. And it was a lot of fun. So, um, so I was getting a first-hand experience of how uh, challenging it can be to get people in the seats. You know, I, I did this movie, people that saw it liked it for what it was. Um, and it was like, well, geez, how, do I, how, do, how does that work? How do you get people? It's not just I made a movie and everybody shows up. And it's not exactly like, you know, it didn't get into Sundance, so I didn't have the, you know, Kevin Smith experience or Richard Linklater or those guys. Um, 
so, um, but it was, the whole thing was fun. The, the, the craziest promotion we did in the, at that time, we, at one point, we, even me or my friend that was doing it, because I actually, in addition to screening my movie, we screened my friend's independent feature too. So like mine was Odd Nights, his was Even Nights, and we both did it together. So we were both promoting this, these two independent films together. At one point, we even put like a gorilla suit on around the street. We we're doing all sorts of things. And um, so how, uh, so I got a firsthand experience of what it's like to be the business part of it. How do you get people, how difficult is it to tell people about your movie and get them to care about it? And who is gonna care about this movie? Because I wasn't thinking about that. I was just thinking about my own voice and something that felt true to me at the time, you know, for good and for bad. How is that picture of being a working Hollywood screenwriter different now? Well, I think the creative part of it is the same. I'm no more or less creative than I ever was. Um, uh, and my love of it is basically the same, but I'm able to look at the process in a way that's uh, deeper uh, and more fun and easier. Um, and so the quality of my uh, choices that are gonna be um, more impactful, they come more often and they come at a greater flow. And when I have the ideas that are just a little bumpy or not quite as strong, I don't get hung up on them. So it's sort of the grace of my efficiency has increased significantly in the way I think about it and the way I allow myself to have more joy more often. So my creative process is profoundly different. Although like if you asked me one single question and I had to have a creative answer to that now or when I was 22, it would be kind of the same. But my craft is profoundly different. And how that relates to um, the way I see working writers you know, and myself, it's, it's um, my creativity will be, I'll be hired by producers to work on some sort of project and, um, and then I show up and we're, we, we see it through fruition and it just, and there's sometimes overlapping projects and there's sometimes lulls in between and then when there's a lull in between, I'm writing my own new spec material. So I'm always writing um, and there's joys of writing my own spec material and there's joys of writing on assignment. Um, you know, I mean, the money part of the assignment for, guaranteed is nice, um, but it's really the deeper joy there for me is I'm working with a team of people and we have to find out a way where I'm loving it and they're loving it. Um, I mean, ultimately they get the final say, but they hire me because they really want my, my view, right? You know, because um, there's something I did in either a sample or the way I pitched an, an idea to them that they felt like, yeah, this, you know, this guy can really contribute. So, um, so it's that creative flow that I told you about that's fully there when I'm doing spec work um, and it's, it's playing well with others in a sandbox. It's really kind of that simple and there's a whole complication to it, but it really is that simple. So, um, uh, and, and I guess the other thing is that there's a piece with the sort of freelance nature of it, the feast and famine, the busy and then the flow. And then, and the, the paradox is the more relaxed you are about when projects come, when doors close and how you respond to them, um, the easier things happen. Um, and, and the times in my career when I was like, eggs, eggs, I gotta make it happen, I was inadvertently pushing it away. You know, it's like the um, the cool kid in high school. You know, this person's like, you know, he, you know, all the guys liked him, the girls liked him, and he was he wasn't doing anything. He was just kind of like cool, <laughs> you know. And so um, we all have that cool person inside us, um, and maybe some of you were that cool. And the funny thing is, if you talk to one of those people, um, they may not may, they might not even have seen themselves as the cool person, but like. Um, but there absolutely is that part of all of us that has that sort of charisma, our own authentic charisma. And when we show up with that part of ourselves in a meeting, uh, in the, um, the outreach part of the game, um, where we're, there's no desperation, we're not boring, we're just um, at ease and we're ourselves, what ends up happening is we're, um, it's about connecting dots so that we make ourselves the exact dot that we wanna be and then the buyer of the script is the exact they're looking for that dot and that's how they connect. So um, yeah, I don't know if that, that makes sense. It does, I, and, and I wanna talk more about law of attraction and things later, um, yeah. and, and you had some great videos on your channel about that as it relates to story. What if things aren't so joyous 
and you know that in, in terms of staying with the project and playing well in the sandbox, there are going to be times where you're challenged mm -hmm. and maybe you didn't think of that before when you were at NYU because it was all fun and everybody was sort of, you were in this together and, and you could have drinks afterwards or whatever it was. You knew each other well. But now the stakes are different. How do you, how do you view it now? Because things don't always go well in sandbox. Yeah. So, um, well, my experience at NYU was was awesome and very competitive. Um, at least because I'm a competitive person, so maybe I was bring, bringing that to it. Um, so it was it was lots of fun and it, and it was a great experience. But it was you know there was actually about half the people there were kind of still figuring stuff out, and then the other half were kind of killers and they were they were getting after it. Um, so um, to me, that side of it, th those pressures were were similar. But to your point, that's different. Like, you know, NYU is like, we paid the money, we get the thing, that's it. In the marketplace, it's like we put up or we don't get employed. You know what I mean? So, so there's those pressures um, that are really different. But ultimately, it's, it's the same game. It's like, um, I either have an idea that's going to contribute to this producer's vision of what they want to do with the project or don't. And so um, when I show up and have a meeting and share my take on something or... Um, or he's, they've already hired me, and I do a draft. It's like I just I only can do the best that I can do, and then um, they look at it, and and then we go from there. I mean, it's um, so it's so yes, the the doors close, um, and oftentimes people will frame that situation of a closed door as um, a challenge or terrible or this or that or the other. And um, I understand that, and I have empathy for that, and it's just. Um, it's paying attention to the wrong thing and it's actually a self-imposed limitation to kind of even think of it that way. You just say, um, yeah, you, you just count the wins. You know, this is a win, this is a win, this is a win, and then the wins stop at some point. But like, <laughs> um, and it sounds like Pollyanna-ish because it is, and yet um, as I've tried that sort of mindset, it's just, A, it feels better, it's real fun, and it works better because Again, you, you're shifting into that cool kid in high school. Everything's just, it's just okay. You know, you work it out. It's either this, okay, yeah, this door closed, doesn't matter. There's one behind it. And then, okay, that one closed, fine. Then there's one behind it. And the more we focus on that, it really does, the paradox is, the more we're not attached to when the door finally opens, the faster they open. The watch pot never boils. Kind of That's thing. right. <laughs> it absolutely never boils in Hollywood. And you cannot be desperate and you can't be boring. Um, and so... Uh, the way to not be desperate and the way to not be boring is the way to not be boring is being authentic to yourself, and the way to not be desperate is realize that it's okay. It's gonna work out. This, the, the universe is on the job. You do you do your stuff. I go up. I I make the best creative choices I can. Um, either I'm specking material, I'm working with this partner or whatever, and um, and it's it. It's gonna work out. Did you always think like this? No. <laughs> Not at all. That was the thing. So um, I was always, um, I always loved it, right? And I, I loved it and I was very productive. There's some people that have like a motor and they go and go and go. And that's sort of how my sort of, you know, I made 50 short film experiments before I even got to NYU. And then um, at NYU, a ton more, right? So I was just, I could just go. Um, and um, I would, what most people do, see what's going on out there. And, um, and if things were going well, I would feel good. If things were not going well, if a door closed, I would feel bad, right? So, um, and that is a terrible <laughs> way to live in general um, in the way most people do it in a sense because um, it hooks us into um, the roller coaster and this business is very much um, that sort of cyclical up down. There's, there's these things happening beyond what we can completely control. So, um, so what I would do is, you know, hustle and get excited and kind of effort my way, this, that. And, you know, I could make things happen and things were good and I would progress. But the progression of my career literally happens so much faster when I'm, I'm focused and I have a goal and I know where I'm going, but I'm not, um, I'm, I'm just not hooked into it. It's going to happen or it's not. This is going to be, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm good with whatever happens. And it's... Um, and, and it's a practice. You have to be able to practice that in little ways and in big ways. And as I, in my career, was able to practice that more often, A, 
my existential experience of life got better. I just felt better about me. And, um, and milestones got crossed just much faster. This milestone, that milestone, it, all, it was easy. No effort, everything's easy. Um, and it's, it's a practice. And so, um, yeah, so back in the day, I didn't know any different. So I didn't, I didn't know to do it that way. And I have a, uh, uh, an accountability partner uh, who's, a, who's a, uh, a professional TV writer. And I remember a few years ago, he said he got this job writing on the show and he was like, yeah, you know, and there was no effort and it was so easy. And I just, um, you know, I didn't have to chase it down. And my mind was kind of hurting. So like, what, what do you mean? What, what's wrong with this? I spent my whole life hustling and making things happen. And he just, I realized that he was in this place where he was A, valuing, not hustling, not efforting, letting things be easy. And I didn't realize that was possible. And if it was possible, that it could actually work. And if it could work, it actually felt better. And so in talking to him and then reading a lot and, um, you know, and this is sort of law of attraction stuff and, you know, you know, not getting caught up in some of the woo-woo aspect of those things, um, but really looking at the tangible, more grounded aspects of them and then trying them. And as I tried them, everything got better. I, it felt, felt better. I enjoyed it more. My creative process got um, easier, more powerful, more consistent. My job became, I get up and I'm happy. And, um, and then, oh yeah, what's going on out there? And uh, is secondary, you know what I mean? And, it, and it's, again, it's not 100%, I'm not like all rainbows and butterflies, but um, if you talk to people that I work with, um, they'll pretty much say that most of the time I'm, I'm feeling pretty happy and balanced. And, and, and it's because I'm in the habit. I'm in the habit of whatever, whatever, um, whatever happens to me out there, I respond in a way that just, um, is aware of the of the sort of the abundance and, and the bigness and the greatness that's there around some of the, the challenges and, and, and you know the pieces of the challenges. Does that make sense? It does. And balance is something that's very important to you. This is sort of the scales. Mm -hmm. It is. It is. I, you know. Um, yeah, I would say yeah. Certainly, certainly, flow is the word that comes up for me. That when I'm in a state of flow, um, that's when it's easy. It's effortless. It's just fun, and it's like you get that time warp experience. You played a lot of sports. Did you have to retrain yourself? Because you said before that you were competitive. Is that helpful? Uh, I love that you brought up sports because um, I've been, so I played uh, soccer in college. I was the captain of the NYU team and intensely competitive. Um, and NYU is a division three school. So division one schools are like, they're all about it. And division three schools are students that also play, right? So, but I wanted to study the film school. So I was there, but I was really competitive too. So um, uh, this idea of how much winning matters and how to um, sort of make sense of winning in the scope of things uh, and, and how to, it, it, it absolutely fascinates me and it completely relates to this whole idea of mindset because, again, the same paradox that we talked about with Hollywood is like if you're too desperate for something, you're actually pushing it away. And in sports, if you're too desperate for hitting a free throw shot or something happening in soccer or whatever it is, you can't, you, have, you gotta be loose and you gotta have that flow. It's, this, it's, it's exactly the same thing. And that's actually one of the ways I was able to sort of find value in the law of attraction ideas, um, you know, and sort of just, you know, not not pay too much attention to the metaphysical parts of it because they might be true, but if it's metaphysical, I can't really sort of measure it or make sense of it. But I knew damn sure that when I played sports, if my mindset was confident and easy and active and flowing, the, the numbers, my stats were much better than if I was freaked out or if I was worried about outcome. What if we lose? What if I miss? What if Hollywood doesn't come walking, right? So it's all the what ifs, what ifs. And so, um, it absolutely was a direct connection for me to sort of take what I learned as an athlete and then what I, because I've also coached a lot of kids in, in um, sports as well, my own kids, and I even coached a high school soccer team for a season, which was amazing. And um, I love that mindset stuff. It, it just makes a, it makes a big difference, um, certainly in sports, absolutely in entertainment, and really it, it crosses over pretty much anywhere. Should a new writer look at writing as a fun endeavor or should they really check themselves in the beginning and say, okay, is this something I want to take on? The time commitment, uh, time away from maybe friends and family. Maybe there are going to be parts that won't be so joyous. Uh, it's a great question. And um, 
Yeah, absolutely do it because it's fun. There's no other reason to do it. And if it's not completely fun, do anything else. You know, Find what is fun for you. If there was something that was a hobby for you that mm -hmm. you loved but you didn't want to take it on as a career, could you say the same for writers? Maybe they just want to write for the sheer joy of it, for creating characters, but they don't want the pressure of having to pitch and have to pay their car payment based on whether they sell a script or not. Yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. No, that's um, one of the most satisfying experiences I get from writing. Yeah, the fact that I get paid well to write is separate from my experience of of writing. I mean, if I didn't make a dime from anything I wrote the rest of my life, I would still write. I mean, it's because it's it's so <laughs> deeply satisfying in terms of executing my vision for how life occurs to me. What are my deepest challenges? What are my um, what are the insights that have sort of gotten me through different parts of my life? How do I how did I um, make a transformation from this stage to that stage. I mean, that's what we do in any screenplay. And if I'm writing about an astronaut or this or that, um, you know, I've never been an astronaut, but I've written about several. Um, but it's the emotional journey of those characters that's that's as personal to me as if I'm writing in a journal. So, um, if somebody is drawn to screenwriting for the sheer joy of it, that's absolutely what they should be doing, and they. And nobody really should be worrying about the money side of it. If it's so fun for you to write a screenplay and so fun for you to share it with anybody and so fun for them to say, I love it, and so fun for them to sort of give you feedback and so fun for you to take that feedback and find a way to serve them even better and so fun to keep that going, then absolutely that person should allow the professional part of it to come to them. And if they stop at any point in that path and they're happy just writing it for themselves and showing it to nobody, that's great. I mean, it's really about what makes them happy. Is that the litmus test? Is it fun? Yeah. Really? So is that how you approach most things in life though? It has to be where it's not creating huge amounts of stress for you? Yeah. Um, Absolutely. I read a wonderful book years ago about uh, Ben and Jerry's Ice Cream Company. Um, I, loved, I loved it so much I cried when I, when I finished uh, reading it and it was because they, to my mind, um, had a beautiful vision of fun and business. You know, it's show and it's business. And the way they articulated it was this double bottom line. Anything they did had to, had to be fun and it had to be profitable, right? Um, and the truth is, um, if you approach it the right way, um, you absolutely can do both. And if you're not seeing the way to do both, have something be profitable and lucrative and fun and easy, you're not looking in the right direction. It's probably like right behind you. You got to turn around and look someplace else. But it really is. And I'll, in my writing process or my life, certainly things come up and it feels there's a resistance or something's not easy. And then that's just a reminder to go, dude, it's you know you're this is you're forcing it. It's too much. And then I go, oh, okay. Well, what's the easy? What's the easy way? What's the easy way? And then it's well, oftentimes it's stopping and breathing, or or not thinking about it. Think about something else that is easy in the moment, and then going to that. Um, and then um, and when when I hold those spaces open, the easy ways come. Have you had people challenge you, students, mentees, that say work isn't supposed to be fun? Aside from this interview, or I'm playing, I, playing the devil's advocate yeah, here, but I, I love it. Well, it's um, I mean that's the standard, right? So, um, uh, and 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 so it's where and and people are people have to. I can sit here and tell them this or that or the other, and uh, they. They need to figure it out for themselves and they need to try it if they're interested and not try it if they're not interested. It's not right for them if they hear it and it's too crazy and, and you know, then that's fine. So um, I have no interest in um, uh, convincing uh, somebody of anything. I mean, if I, you know, uh, when I used to teach this class at UCLA, UCLA Extension, um, I would absolutely speak to these ideas. Um, and. They wouldn't really challenge me. I'm sure some people were very skeptical and some people were flat out like, that's crazy, that can't work. And 
that's fine. You know, uh, it certainly can't work for them if that's the way they think. <laughs> um, and um, it might work for you even if you're skeptical if you try it and you say, okay, I think it's probably not going to work, but I'm going to be open to it. And, and, and I, I might try it and you see. And what will happen, at least in my experience, is um, A, it feels better. And if nothing else, if, the, if, the, uh, if there's no law of attraction, if it's all hooey and um, the odds of something happening are exactly the same, but your approach to life feels better and you've got the same odds, it's worth doing it. So my invitation to anybody who's skeptical is I honor the skepticism, try it out, see if you enjoy it more, see if the odds are at least the same of getting what you want as soon as you want and, and see if you don't have the experience that I've had and I've seen pretty much everybody that embraces the theory have, you actually get things faster because I'm open to opportunities in a way that's different when I'm closed off and I'm focused on, oh crap, this is going to happen, I'm scared of that or this didn't happen or I'm not good enough or I'm an imposter or all these things, these voices that come up. Um, you know, it's good to notice that they're there and just let them go and if we spend too much time on them or we spend any time, just, just notice them like the wind and let it go through um, because the more we sort of give them attention, the more we're sort of limiting ourselves. So you're also not attached to other people's opinions, it sounds like too, which is a beautiful place to be. It's the best place to be because um, my I'm here to serve my audience. So um, if I have, um, you know, so so you know, I'll have a bunch of ideas in my script that I've that I've put down, and when I get feedback, I'm. It's not me getting feedback. It's like these ideas came to me. They're in service to the audience. And my job is to sort of get out of the way and just whatever the best idea from anywhere to better serve the audience. Um, and so when I get feedback and criticism, if there's any piece in that that's going to be more of service to the audience, awesome. And if it's not going to be in service, okay, fine. Thanks for at least you know trying to give me feedback. You know. So uh, does that answer your question? It does, yeah. How did the book Save the Cat change your life? Oh, it made a huge impact on my life because up to the point where I um, picked up that book, I was muscling my way through a writing process. I'd taken Robert McKee's course and, and, and a bunch of others and I liked it. I love theory. It's fascinating to me. And I went to NYU Film School so I got nothing but theory there. Um, and, uh, and I'd made, I think, uh, I just finished like the fifth feature screenplay that I wrote and that one was maybe the third independent feature that I made and it was um, and it was another personal drama and it was good for what it was but it was this sort of self-imposed ceiling that I put on my career. It was, um, <laughs> I love the subject matter and I'm proud of it but it was so obscure that um, it, it just, all the real greatness of those ideas were not as accessible as they could be had I sort of reordered the ideas or built them in a different way. And so I finally, and this was probably my mid-30s, I, I um, got the humility to say, okay, maybe Hollywood knows a few things about story structure that I should actually figure out. And again, I'd taken these other courses, but McKee is great, but he's so, sort of his theories are all these different really cool pieces, but they, there was no system at least that I could get from his, his sort of uh, weekend lecture. But I liked it. I think I might have done it tw twice in my 20s. Um, Blake Snyder's system to me was an absolute, life changer, game changer completely because he has his own genre system. He's got his own step-by-step um, -step process. Um, and, uh, and, and I took his, after I loved the book, I took his weekend seminar and his energy was delightful, just playful, fun, really accessible, super smart. Um, so I learned from him personally, I learned from his theory and I still use it now. And so it just, it completely revolutionized the way that I think about concept, think about structure, think about process. I mean, it's a night and day difference. And what I use now and what I, when I mentor writers, what I help them with is a variation of, of, of Blake's system um, that I've tailored to my own sort of professional process. And it's just a step-by-step -step process of really focusing on those story design choices. Because what most writers will do is they'll go, oh, I got an idea for a movie and maybe they'll have a character or two or, whatever, and then they jump ahead to um, writing the script. And now they're writing the script, they write like, try to write the final draft of the script and it's a fiasco. That process 
so difficult to get right. And again, everybody has their own process. So if that's the one you're using and it's working for you, great. Um, in my experience, for my own work and working with a lot of writers, um, it's, it's, there's just so many missed opportunities um, from focusing. I, I break it down into seven steps based similar to, to Blake's system. So I, and, and it's a simple way to say it is I, I tell the story, I get them to tell the story or do my own work in one sentence and then five sentences and then 15 sentences, which is like Blake's 15 beats, and then 40 sentences, which are basically a, a sentence for each uh, scene in the movie, more or less. Um, those are the first four steps. And then the other three are screenplay draft steps. So you have get it down, get it good, and get it great. Um, and, and, it's, and it's a problem. All those, and the, those things are they're steps, but they're really almost like um, there's seven different ways the audience is craving answers about your story. And most writers that aren't like fully firing on all pistons aren't answering those questions as deeply as they could. So I'm good at doing that in my work, at least enough, and then I get feedback and I figure out how to do it even better. And when I work with other people, I just make sure that they're fully answering those questions. And then when they get to the screenplay writing part, um, get it down as just as quickly as you can. Bop, 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 bop. Just, you're almost like formatting it. I usually tell like a, write a treatment in that fourth stage. After I do like the 40 um, sort of sentences for each scene, I'll kind of write, write that into a treatment, five pages, 15 pages, and I'll just copy and paste that into the screenplay format and then I'm just almost reformatting it. Cliche this, cliche that, doesn't matter, blah, 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 but just kind of scaffolding. That's that, that, that um, uh, step um, five. And then step six is get it good. It's not great, it's just kind of, okay, you got a mess of cliches and, and whatever, but you kind of organize it a little bit, just kind of easy breezy, momentum, flow. Um, and then after a few drafts of that, you're like, okay, this is working, you're getting good feedback. Um, again, we're in the reaction game, so it's not enough, if you want to be professional, that, that, um, that I just like it. It's like I have to like it and then it's coming across to other people and they're saying it's great. Um, and then when you're getting that good, then you get into that fine tuning safe. Get it, get it great. So it's get it, get it down, get it good, get it great. And what I see most mistakes they make, so this is that seven step process inspired by Blake's, people will get a loose idea right here, like step one and it will jump to like step seven and it's a <laughs> fiasco. Um, and even if they finish the script, um, you can see it, the script is a mess. Um, and sometimes, you know, if they tell me what their script idea is in one sentence, um, it'll, it'll also be a mess. And I can just, I can, just by seeing the one sentence, I know the same problems they have in, in a 100 page script. When you say some new writers aren't good at providing answers to questions about their characters, is it because they themselves don't know the answers or they're not good at relaying that information um, to the audience? Almost everybody just hasn't thought about it enough. Um, I mean, there's some people that have a laser bead on who these people are, and and um, and they're just in the, and they're sort of developing their skill in terms of articulating on that page with pagecraft. Um, but most of the people just um, it's just a little fuzzy. They haven't spent enough time going. Well, wait a minute, who is that character? Um, for example, I'm writing this 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 script right now, and um, it was interesting because I had this problem with sort of the plotting in the, in the first act, and I couldn't quite work it out and I was, you know, I was like, well, try to figure out this and I tried to figure it out that way, I couldn't do it. And then taking my own advice, I was like, oh, just relax, you can do something else. What is easy now? So I went over to this uh, and I was getting this note from this one character and they were like, well, who's this guy? Why, what is he doing? And I was like, oh yeah, you're right. He's, I kind of had a sense of him, but how can I sort of clarify it, sharpen the focus on him? And then when I did, um, I was like, Oh, I know this guy, and he's <laughs> he's great. He's so swarmy, and he's just he's, he's almost like a, this uh, Paul Giamatti type character. And I was like, oh, he's so fun to write. And then once I got that clarity, I realized, oh, I need a new scene in the first act for this guy because I had it previously happening off screen. But once I got more clarity on who that character was, I added that scene, and then magically it took care of that plot issue that I couldn't get before. So that's a real world example of how I totally use the easy way to solve something. I was using it the hard way at first. I tried it this way, I tried it this way. And I then was like, oh, dude, yeah, no, there's an easy way, don't force it. And then I just went over to something else and I was like, okay, and then boom. Would you say before you read Save the Cat or took some of Blake Snyder's courses that you were bad at structure? That's a great question. I just had a very rudimentary beginning, middle, and end sense of structure. And I, 
The problem is I had kind of too many halfway ideas about it. You know, this guru, that guru, the other. And I, I remember one time I made the spreadsheet. Probably when I was in my 20s. I'd probably written two or three. And I was, it was literally like 50 or 60 boxes and like this question and that question. And it was just a mess of like, there was no connective tissue to it. So when I found Blake Snyder's system, which had really deep, actionable insights about why movies from Hollywood work and a system step-by-step step to sort of move through it, it just, it all came together for me. How do you teach structure to your students? I teach structure to my students, um, generally starting with Blake's method. So um, uh, we talk about concept. We talk about um, uh, five story. Well, Blake talks, Blake goes from concept to 15, uh, he, what he calls beats, but they're not even really beats. It's, um, it's he's, what he'll have is in his 15 beats are, there's some turning points and there's sequences. Um, and then he's got opening image, closing image, which is, which is a great bookending device. And then he calls out your B story, which is your second most significant thread. And then he, um, he talks about the theme, how it should be stated early on and overtly. Um, and, and that's it. So there's a few things that are, um, but it's kind of a weird word. So I, I kind of think of his sort of 15 story, but they're all pertinent. It's like I for sure am writing a better screenplay when I have good answers for each of those 15 things, whatever you want to call them. Um, the thing, one of the things I added to, to my process that he doesn't really talk about is uh, starting with the, the, you know, the log line and premises is huge and then 15 beats is really helpful. But in between those two, there's, I, t I do five sentences. So act one, act two A, or what Blake calls fun and games, your midpoint turn, and then act two B, and then act three. Um, so it's more or less the three act structure, but it's broken out into these pieces. I mean, this is a turning point, but like it's so important to kind of call it out. And so sometimes when I'm even coming up with a movie idea for the, in, in the very beginning, I'll kind of have a couple pieces of the concept and I'll actually maybe sketch it out, the five, the five sentences. But it's all easy. It's kind of like, well, oh, I know where it's going to end and I'm not quite sure about this part or that part. So I just fill in what I know and go to the other parts and just kind of play with it. And then it just comes together. Um, if it's a good idea and if it's easy, it'll come together. And if it's not, um, coming together, at least right now, I just put it aside, do something else that is easy. And then you said if, to further flesh it out, 40, you, you do like you number one through 40 and then you have one sentence be each scene? That's right. So for that, that like, uh, that's my step four process, right? It'll, um, and, and most m movies will have about 40 scenes, you know, plus or minus five or 10 or whatever. So um, I want to get a sense of, I'll expand those 15 beats to like the 40 scenes. And if it's 35, I don't care. It's fine. I just note, oh, I'm a little bit short. Because here's the thing. The thing with structure that throws off a lot of people is, <laughs> especially people that aren't comfortable with it yet. They're like, I don't want to follow those rules. I'm just, it's confining me. <laughs> so, and they use that exact tone of voice too. <laughs> no, um, so, so, but what it, what's most instructive to me and how I also work with, with um, you know, men, my mentees or students or whatever, I, um, it's the expectations of the audience. The audience is absolutely craving a beginning, middle, and end. They're craving your, your break into act two to happen someplace around you know, the late 20s, you know, 25 minutes, 20, you know, Blake says 27 minutes. So it doesn't have to be on that page, but, um, but if I write it and it's five pages after that or 10 pages, I'm aware of that and it's the opportunity to go, I know the audience is expecting this around 27. Do I have enough legit, have I earned their trust to go longer? Um, am I, so it's totally fine to sort of go against their expectations, um, but I wanna do it mindfully. Um, or it's an opportunity to go, huh? I'm, you know, my, I'm breaking into two at act, at, you know, page 35. Is there something I can? Oh, you know what? I totally can cut this whole scene or trim this down, and then I get it closer. So it's an opportunity to very definitively look at what the audience is expecting in a very concrete way, and go, do I want to play two audience expe expectations here, or go against it? So specifically with the 40. Um, you know, 40 sentences for the scenes, you know, again, plus or minus five or 10 or whatever. Um, I'll do that and then I, I, um, so I, so I have the sort of bone structure of how I can go and I often put them on index cards and a board in my, my home office. And, um, 
And, uh, and then I like to go from there before I go to the script to actually write a treatment as well for two reasons. One is um, the, uh, those 40 cards are really good for sort of structural choices and sort of thread flow and that sort of thing. Um, but they don't get the feeling really of the story. So that's why I go to a treatment. And then the second reason is, um, you know, nobody's going to look at my 40 beats and really get what I'm doing. So if I want feedback and I get a lot of feedback in the treatment stage, um, uh, I write the treatment and then I can, you know, five pages, 10 pages, whatever it takes. The, the screenplay that I'm working on now, I actually did three drafts of the treatment, got really good feedback between every one. Then realized that I wanted to change the protagonist from one character to the other. Um, and then did three more drafts of the treatment and then felt it was good and then I'm into the screenplay. So by the time I get to the screenplay, my first draft, you know, it's not really a first draft because I've spent so much time designing the story, doing the treatment. It's, it's probably a typical, you know, fifth draft or tenth draft for other people. At what point should a writer have earned the audience's trust? And if it's not there by that point, it's going to be hard to get it later. Uh, page, <clears throat> page one. <laughs> um, you know, um, I mean, I'll, I'll look at a screenplay and, and literally line one, I'm already going, Really? does wow. this person have the job? I can't look, I can't look at one line and definitively say, but, I, but I'll tell you what, you, give me, you show me the first sentence, or maybe not, the, it, it can't be just the slug line, the slug line in one sentence of, um, you know, you should, it is interesting, but if I saw the slug line in one sentence of 10 screenplays, um, I bet you I could tell you how much I'm going to like that screenplay um, within probably 80% likelihood. Like I can see a professional crafted line in, in just two sentences. Um, I don't do that that harshly or whatever, but like, you know, I'll at least give them a page or two if I'm going to sort of evaluate something. But like, um, there's just so many choices. I mean, you're talking, it's, it's, it's sort of like poetry in a sense where every word counts and you can often, when you've done it for so long, realize I don't need that word, I don't need that word, I can subtract, subtract, you get that white space flowing on the page so you can um, just very efficiently and then muscular word choices and specific words, there's so much to be seen again. So I'll, I'll even say this, if you take, a, if you take even the way the slug line is formatted and the way they're talking about the time of day and those things, those are choices and um, and amateurs tend to make one pool of choices and professionals tend to make other ones, again, tendencies. But like, yeah, I would think 80% of the time I could look at two lines and I could feel like this is probably a professional or somebody at least writing at the professional level. And so if that page one is not, is not up to par, it's going to be very difficult, almost impossible maybe, to gain that trust for the reader or well, audience so, later on? So yes, but it's not binary, right? So what will happen is... Um, you know, all anybody who's spending the hours and hours of time writing a screenplay has some sort of talent. You know what I mean? They have something going on, right? So, you know, I don't think I've ever read a screenplay that had like zero, like <laughs> nothing, right? There's something, you know. So, um, but what'll happen is I'll get to page one if I was just picking up a random script from random amateur writer, and I look at page one. Again, I look at line two or three, and I'm already knowing. Yeah, this person's probably, you know, from the scale of totally professional to total beginner, within two sentences, I know that, okay, this is probably where this person is. And I'll get to the end of the first page, and I'm now I have a 90% chance or 95% chance of knowing where they are. Now, that being said, if I'm a production company and I'm looking for a thriller and my friend said he read, he read this thriller and it was amazing, and I read page one and I'm going, okay, my friends, I trust my friend. He's saying it's amazing. I'm looking at this thing. It's not a, really a professional level written thing. It's kind of amateurish. I might not toss it in the trash at that point. I might go, um, okay, but you're it's 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 it, you're leaning against it. You're sort of you're you're minimizing it. So it's important not to see it in a binary way where it's this or that. But at a certain point in Hollywood, it will be binary. They'll, they'll give you first of all, they're not even going to read the script unless in one sentence you you can pitch the story. Um, and then they'll go, oh yeah, that's worth my time. And they'll give it a couple pages and then toss it when it's not any good. It's more than just formatting issues though. You said it's also like word choices and uh, you know, it's not just how much white's on the page or even the it's, slug. It's all those things, right? Because it's the, the screenplay format is so, um, it's kind of clunky. It's a clunky format, right? Um, 
you know, uh, the way the slug line works and it just, it's sort of, yeah, I mean, whereas prose, it's just like a waterfall of, of words, you know, uh, I don't even write prose, but like, um, but the screenplay format is just, it's blocky. Um, and so because there's those limitations, um, when you get really familiar with the format, you can see people very quickly making choices within this sort of format that are, you know, different good or different bad or, or different inexperienced. You know, there was a script, a spec script that came out a couple of years ago that was doing all sorts of crazy things with fonts and craziness. And um, I love a little of that when it's organic and it feels inspired. Um, but this script, I, 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 you know, I wanted to wring somebody's neck after about 30 pages. I was like, you know, it's like, oh, wow, cool idea. And I like it because they were really stretching the bounds of the format. Um, and then it felt like to me it was a, um, it was, at least to me, for my sensibility, it was, it felt like a trick or a gimmick. It wasn't that they, um, to my mind, I wasn't able to find my way in emotionally to what their vision was, you know? So, um, so, uh, but I don't know, I mean, um, but they, you know, certainly made a splash doing that. And, um, and who knows, maybe if other people really liked it, then that's, that's great. That's the other thing is it's a subjective business. So, um, you know, I have very refined and, and strongly held beliefs, but I'm just one opinion. You know, I mean, we, you know, we might disagree about what won the Oscar in any given year. You love it, I hate it, or vice versa. And that's a movie that's produced and heralded as the best that we've got and stark disagreements. So um, certainly any spec script um, by any writer, um, you know, it just needs to be, um, I mean, if I'm working with somebody, I'm, What's interesting about that is if I'm, if I'm working with somebody, my opinion doesn't even really come up because it doesn't matter. My, what I do is, or even when I write my own stuff, it's I'm an advocate for their audience and I gently in an inspired way just ask questions what I think that their audience is going to be wondering. You know, why, you know, I think your audience is going to want a more cohesive idea here. You know, what if... Like your, I know your audience is craves to have a sense of irony in your concept. You know, I know your audience might, you know, when you're thinking about constructing your log line, they want a character's goal that is just driven and it's powerful and there's these stakes and then there's a conflict. Um, so I just sort of, I, I articulate what I'm, in my experience, I believe their audience is going to be thinking and that gives the people I work with um, a really fine sort of goalpost for them to shoot at. And that's the great thing is that um, whenever you, whatever your writing process is and whatever your support system is, you, you want to have a really high quality feedback loop so you can stay focused on the task at hand in an inspired way and move as quickly as possible. What slows up writers is they don't have a quality feedback loop system. They kind of figure it out their own. They might read a book, but they can read a book and they don't know if they're actually applying the book or not. Um, and then they might have all sorts of hangups about getting feedback because this person yelled at them and they take toxic feedback or they, or they're, you know, they take too much feedback and they drown out their own voice. There's all sorts of nightmares, but like having a world-class um, feedback and development system is absolutely one of the best things I've done for my career. Um, I mean, and I'm so good at it. I can even, I can even take to somebody that's like a lay person that doesn't even know the business and I can ask them for feedback in a certain way and it gives me a high quality echo of what's going on. If you just hand them, if I hand my sister the script and my sister's awesome and uh, she, she used to always watch our, our high school movies and she always has some belting laugh. <laughs> we call her like the laugh anchor. But anyway, but in general, if I was to give her my script uh, and she would basically say, oh, well, I liked it or I didn't like it, right? That's sort of base level analysis. Um, but what you can do is take even a lay person, if you direct them in the right way with how you ask for feedback. So, you know, uh, you, you know, for my sister, I could say, was there any, um, what was your favorite character? Was, um, which character do you feel like you wanted to know more about or needed more sort of development? <clears throat> which scenes felt like you didn't need them, right? These are questions she absolutely can answer um, definitively from her opinion. And she would have almost never thought to 
tell that to me if I just gave it to her because she's a layperson, right? She's just going, oh, I, I like this line of dialogue, or this was great, or, or I didn't like it, or whatever. So, um, so whatever writers use for their feedback system, whether they have a writer's group, or a coach, or accountability partner, or whatever works for them, um, I would invite them to have it be a really high quality echo because we're anticipating, we're in the reaction business and we're anticipating that reaction from the audience and the better that feedback loop can be and the quicker it can be, the faster our career will move forward. What do you say to screenwriters who are insulted or feel that it's too rushed or you're not respecting the craft when you can tell by page one or even really halfway down the page whether it's a professional level screenplay. What do you say to those people? Um, it's a great question and there, I know a lot of writers um, feel very strongly about that. Like how could you even tell if my screenplay is any good if you've only read you know, you know, one page or even a couple lines? That's rid ridiculous. Um, okay, <laughs> you know, fine. Uh, you can disagree with me all you want. Um, I believe I am familiar enough with this stuff um, and I see patterns and indicators of success, and I see a correlation, um, you know. And I and I believe it. And not only in me, every experienced, right, every like hundred percent of the, not hundred percent, maybe 98 percent of experienced writers that I know, absolutely feel like. Again, it's not binary. They can't read a line or a page and go, "This is definitively crap" or "definitively good," but, you know. You know, all my peers, I, I, I absolutely would put money on them looking at a particular random script and after reading one page, they all for sure could say this is an amateur level writer or this is a, you know, probably, not even 100%, but I think for the most part. And it's just because there's, what I think the people they get upset about is they don't, they don't know what they don't know. They don't realize how many choices they're making on the page and that's probably why they get pissed off is because they're going, okay, the character gets in the car or in such and such happens, but right, but like, you know, I've written 25, 30 screenplays, so I've, and, and, and that's just like finished ones, not to mention some of those drafts were 15, 20, 30 drafts and probably another 30 treatments. So like, I've, I've been in the game for a while and I've seen a lot of stuff and, and you just get familiar with the same thing over and over and over again. So, um, so what they, so a, a, a person writing their first, second, third screenplay, for them, they're just focusing on basic, oh, there's a guy, I see him in the car, and they just say, guy gets in the car. But like, you know, I, I'm seeing that same line and I'm thinking of it on 10 levels. You know, I'm thinking of it on how many words, the, how muscular the words are, the cadence, what's going on before that and after, um, you know, how, um, you know, uh, symbolically, how does it relate to the theme? You know, and again, I don't do all that on the first draft, but by the time I get to that end draft, I'm, every line I've thought about dozens and dozens of times with those different lenses. And because I have that much familiarity with every single line in my screenplay, um, I can read a line from an amateur who's probably looked at that line two times, three times, five times. Um, and when I look at something two times, five times, it's like that. It's not really, it does, you know, it looks like a rough rock. It doesn't look like a gem. When I've seen something a dozen times, 20 times, especially after all my experience, it shines in a different way. You just, the, the magic comes through it in a, in a way that's different. So um, even if you were to look at, you know, my first draft and my, and my last draft, you, you're just seeing a rougher edge with all those things. And that's just part of the process. And that's another thing is that a lot of, um, Amateur writers, they, they won't do as many drafts as they need to to really shine. Or they'll do the drafts, but they're, they're changing the wrong damn things that don't even make a difference. Um, which kind of breaks my heart because um, they've got enough creativity and they love it enough, but they don't know the way through the forest, so they end up spending years and years wandering around. And then some of them quit. It's, it's terrible. Can you give me an example of, of poorly used cadence? Um, so poorly used, that's, that's an interesting question. Poorly used cadence in dialogue would be something that doesn't sound authentic to that character, right? Usually it's the writer's own voice. <laughs> they all sound like, you know me. And you know what, the truth is, um, 
I am fine writing my early drafts pretty much with everybody in my, in my, in my voice. I mean, why not? I mean, if I have an ear for them, fine, I'll do it. But like, even if the thing I'm writing now has this British character and, you know, I'm doing kind of a, you know, whatever loose idea of a British. I, I'll, I'll imagine like um, a guy from Hell's Kitchen or like Pierce Morgan or I mean, what did he say? And I, but like, I don't sweat it. It's sort of like, it's more like me kind of doing a bad British accent or whatever. <laughs> no, that's kind of the cadence that I'm hearing. And then as I get to draft drafts, I'll maybe bring in a friend who's British and go, dude, can you take a look at this? And he'll go, yeah, we would never say this. We would never do that, you know? Or like when I was writing Astronauts, it was great to um, get real astronauts and go, um, yeah, we described this stuff and we're kind of like pulling it off stuff we got out of the internet. I don't, you know, do you tell me? And it was really exciting every time they were like, no, 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 that's legit, that's right. I was like, ooh, wow, it is, it's amazing. So um, cadence for a line of description is really where your voice comes from as a screenwriter. Um, you know, Hemingway very classically had this very simple sort of style. Um, there's most of the screenwriters on the, on the, that make the blacklist every year have a pretty visceral sense of their voice. So if you look at, you pick three scripts from the blacklist and you look at their first couple lines on their first page, you're gonna probably see slight differences in cadence um, in the way they, they talk. And it's just, you feel it, it's, it's weird because it's, it's, cadence is different, it's a, it's a rhythmic thing. Um, uh, and, and you know, word choice plays part of it, but it's just sort of a, it's a rhythm. It's, I, think, I think the first time I thought about, I learned about that sort of thing was um, Spike Lee, um, one of his books, you know, his first, you know, How I Made This, How I Made She's Gotta Have It, whatever that book was. But it was, um, I read the book and I was like, oh, this is exactly the way Spike talks in like interviews and stuff. And I was like, oh, you can do that. You're not supposed to write this kind of fakey fake format that you learn in school. And it was like, and it was so, it just felt more personal, you know? So I think um, screenwriters that have a great voice, they describe those action scenes with, um, not so much like so strongly there, but like there's a sense of their cadence in this genre in service to this particular story. So I haven't read a Spike screenplay in a while. So I don't know exactly what he does on the page, but I would imagine it's, I mean, the thing I read of his was his nonfiction, so it was very much his voice. But voice is, is great. It's probably one of the things that, um, again, most of the scripts that make the blacklist every year are, are mostly powerful in, in voice. Um, and then somewhat in, in concept, although some of the concepts are not very strong, um, and then they can execute. But I, uh, in my UCLA extension class, we would often teach a lot of those um, screenplays from the blacklist. And very interestingly, the, um, the ratings were all over the board. It wasn't like, you know, I wouldn't tell them which ones were on. Sometimes I would, sometimes I wouldn't, but like it didn't matter. There was literally um, some of the scripts they hated the most in the class were blacklist scripts. Wow. It's, it's, there's so much subjectivity in the business, so you just have to know how to, getting back to that feedback system, you know how to take subjectivity out of it. You need enough data points so that it's not um, one person is never making or breaking you or one contest or one whatever. You need enough data points so that um, uh, subjectivity is not a significant factor. I think Kevin Smith too has a very distinct cadence That's to right. his writing and, and, and in his book. And um, That's right. You talked about muscular words. Yeah. Can, you, can you give me an example of a weak muscular word versus a strong one? Um, so um, muscular is sort of like the opposite of um, pa you know passive to or passive active is more good but, but you could say passive or active and then active even more muscular so um, we are talking right is a passive way in a very bland way um, um, we are enthralled in conversation and maybe that's even a little too flowery but right but we are um, digging into the meat of the craft of screenwriting. You know, you can feel the difference between those different word choices. And the amateur will do things like we are talking. And, and that's why you can see it in one, one, one sentence. And then you might have somebody who's getting, low, again, you know, the other thing I said about enthralled or whatever, and that might be a little bit too flowery, right? Um, but you'll see the, um, the writers that have that voice, it, there's, this, there's a poetry to it. It's, it's just beautiful. It's, it's just enough sort of flourish on it. It's not too fancy, or sometimes it will be. Oh, there was a guy that wrote, um, 
uh, I forget his name, but he, um, anyway, th any great screenwriter has really distinct cadence and voice. If we posted a video entitled, The Writing Advice Which Changed My Life, would it be Save the Cat or something else? Um, for sure, if I had to pick one um, most influential theorist on my career, by a long shot, it was Blake Snyder. Him personally and his system. Because uh, I read the book, I was like, wow, this is amazing. I took his class. And I was like, he's amazing. Um, and um, it just was so robust and actionable and easy and accessible and didn't take himself seriously and just helpful. And it was like, oh yeah, it was. this was how I was trying to serve my audience. And he's got so many good ideas on how to serve them better than I was. Taking what I already did that was great and then um, making it more or sort of allowing me to be more articulate in the way that I was serving them. And then... Um, a couple years after that, that I took his his seminar, um, uh, I had won this contest, and part of um, winning that contest with this one screenplay that I wrote with this other writer, um, and he hadn't taken Blake's seminar class. His, his, so, so we're like, oh, and I did it once, and I was like, I will do it again, and that was actually after Blake had died, unfortunately. So I was curious about how somebody else would teach his class, and my writing partner hadn't. Um, uh, taking his seminar at all, but we were both using that system. We were fans. So we went back and, and did it with another instructor who was also wonderful. I mean, it wasn't Blake, but he was wonderful. Um, and it, interestingly, the story that we broke that weekend, we actually sold and set it up. How long did it take you to write it? Well, we broke, uh, you know, his weekend seminar is you go in with, a, start with a log line and you end with um, your 15 beats at the end. So um, we broke the sort of, the, the you know the structure of it then and then we probably did I don't know I'm sure a month or two of sort of breaking it out and then my guess is we probably had and then lots of drafts when we, it was probably after that weekend probably three months after that we probably had a draft we had a producer attached to that already and we were going to make that one ourselves directed ourselves um, but the producer was like, dude, this guy, this is really good. <laughs> we, I think I can get this set up someplace else. And we said, great. So then we um, ended up, and that's the script that got me signed to UTA. And then we started uh, uh, taking around and ended up getting set up. And uh, that was great. How did you meet that producer? I went to NYU with him. Oh, nice. Okay. And, so uh, alumni pays off. Yeah. Uh, it did in this case. It did in this case. I mean, my, look, I... Feel I have some strong mixed feelings about NYU. I generally experientially I loved it. Um, it was you know some of my favorite times. I have lots of favorite times in my life, but I, I really enjoyed it. Um, the cost of those programs generally doesn't sort of pay out. The return on that investment to me feels out of whack. Um, uh, so um, so there's there's that and people that are doing undergrad probably you can justify a little bit more, but those MFA programs are really expensive. And um, and people, if they have the money, awesome, that's great. Um, but if they're taking out those loans for those programs, that's a heartbreaker because, um, you know, no matter how good you are, that's just a big burden. Uh, so the logistics of that is, is I think, um, really problematic. Um, so, uh, but I like the film school experience, and, and partly a lot of people talk about the pe people that you meet there, right? So, if nothing else, because it's you know NYU is seen as some people consider it the best film school, certainly one of the best. Um, people are then attracted to it for those reasons. I want to go where the best is, right? So, so I met really great people there, and um, and so that made a big impact. And this was one producer that I did. But the truth is, if I were to go back, I wouldn't go to film school. If I was rich, I wouldn't. It'd be fine, but I wouldn't because. I would have maybe hung out at Sundance and been a volunteer there and met those same damn people that way. Or, um, you know, there's lots of different ways to meet people, which is important. And that's, people say, well, film school, you can meet people. Great, but like, you're meeting the people and you're paying an arm and a leg for it. So um, there's there's other ways to meet people that are at that ambition level that, that, that you might be attracted to if you want to do really sort of world-class work, um, which you'll get at USC, NYU, AFI, those places. Um, but there's other places to meet those same people. Um, and when you show up with your power or your superpower or who you are, um, you find people, you find the right people and the people that aren't your type, you just you know get filtered out. 
Yeah, and, and the thing for Gen Xers like you and I is that social media wasn't around, crowdfunding wasn't around, and it's so valuable now because you can meet so many people. Let's suppose you have a successful campaign, now you need an editor, you can find somebody in another country and, and they can, you know, but, but all, those options weren't available. At that yeah, time. a totally different world. So, I mean, you, you know, your YouTube channel is, is one wonderful way of them, you know, democratizing it. I mean, the information you guys have, one person after another with these really great ideas, oh, um, just makes it so much more accessible for all sorts of people, um, you know, and makes, it, um, you know, justifying the cost for those really expensive, um, you know, film programs, especially the MFA programs, just, you know, again, if you got the money, it's awesome. It's a great sure. one-stop shop. And you can have some, forge some great memories that you're you're not going to get other places. So you know, in terms of making a film together and and watching it together. So, um. if a writer is being ignored by Hollywood, is that a sign that possibly their work is just not ready yet? Maybe. <laughs> it's a great question. So um, there's two things going on here. Um, most likely, they're probably not ready. That's that's more likely, and. Because it's subjective business, it's entirely possible that work is totally ready and just hasn't found the right person at the right time. So, how do you know which one is you with your script? That's when we come back to this idea of a high quality feedback system, right? So first your internal system with where you're developing it, and then when you get it to the point where you feel like it's as great as you can make it, then if you're an amateur, you go to screenplay contests or blacklist.com or specscout.com or Coverfly, really great places to see where you stack up. And um, the metrics I generally suggest are 10 places. It could be an industry, it could be somebody that works, it could be a friend of yours that's an intern at such and such production company. It could be one of the contests, it could be one of those screenplay exchanges that I just mentioned. Any of those things, if it's somebody in the industry that could be like, oh my God, this is the best script I ever read, I'm gonna turn around and give it to so-and-so and they could do something with it. That to me counts as an open door. If it's your friend who went to film school with you, that doesn't count, because unless that person's you know, Spielberg's kid or something, right? So um, it's gotta be somebody that has the agency to sort of move it, move it forward. Out of 10 data points, whether in every contest, everybody's like, oh, contest sucks. Believe me, every contest has an opportunity to break your career. They, they, they don't exist. They're there to try to help you, right? And you know, maybe there's one or two scams out there, but by and large, they're trying to help you. They want your script to be amazing. So, um, so they're all data points. So you, if you submit to 10 places in the industry, contest, exchange, whatever, and at least three out of the 10, only three out of the 10, you are and getting an open door, then you're actually in a good place. At, that's the minimum, right? And by that means, an open door is you advance in that contest, you get maybe a seven on the blacklist, or you're pretty high in the specs out, but you're basically, you're getting to the point where either that organization is like, ooh, we wanna keep you listed on our site because we feel like we might wanna take credit for your success, right? Anybody advances, that's what they're doing. If you uh, submit it to your friend who's working at such and such and they submit it up to the producer and like, oh, this is interesting. We're not gonna set this up, but maybe you come in for a general meeting or the next thing you write, right? That's an open door. Anything that's sort of, that counts as like um, a longer term relationship escalation, that counts. If you don't get it, if you get um, rejected by the screenplay, if Blacklist gives you a three, if whatever, if, if, it's, if it's a closed door, um, then it's just a data point. No big deal, okay, it's a data point. So when you, then you look at those data points, and if you're not getting, if you're only getting one or two out of 10, you know, it's probably because the material is not close. And then you go back and you go, okay, well, I thought it was close. Here's what I'm doing. Here's what my comparable movie's doing. What's the difference? How do I close that gap? You close that gap by a high quality feedback loop. People that know what they're doing, people that'll give you a sense, and then you'll figure out. And then you go back and you resubmit, right? If you are getting um, more, let's say you're, you know, five at it, like half, you, know, you have a great script and half the places you submit to, you're, you're advancing, or maybe you won one outright, right? Great. So now you're in a different place. Now you're for sure ringing the bell. And now it's a numbers game. That's when you double down. Um, and I did this myself. When I was first starting out and entering contests, we had a script, uh, me and this one writing partner, and it made the, the quarterfinals of the Nickel Fellowship. And I was like, oh, that's nice. So um, I'm gonna double down. 15 more screenplay uh, contests to that for that script, right? Because I already knew that it was proven. 
And, and so then I had 16 data points. And what happened? Eight of them were open doors of some sort and eight of them, nothing. And one of the things that breaks my heart is like writers come up to me and be like, yeah, you know, I submitted my script to like two or three places and like, you know, I only got into one or whatever. But they, they don't, they're not taking subjectivity out of it. You need data points, right? So of that one script, and, and one of those scripts, we won the grand prize, we won $10,000. So if our script, we've submitted to three of those places by chance and they all got rejected and we just gave up, this left $10,000 on the table, right? So, uh, so you got to take subjectivity, subjectivity out of it by getting enough data points. Um, and so, uh, and then once you have something that's, again, you're getting, you know, 50%, at least 30%, but you want 50, 60, 70% sort of open door rate, then you buy as many lottery tickets as you can, as many festivals as you can. Get out. There's also other ways you can, you can meet anybody you want in Hollywood. This, this idea that the, the doors are closed are ridiculous because um, all you need, you just need to, you need to know how to entertain your way into talking to people. I mean, that's the truth. And there's way, you know, and usually the way most people query Hollywood is ridiculous. It's um, what you need to do is um, empathize with where the other person is and approach them with an easy ask. Maybe you ask them a question. Maybe you look at their Twitter account. You see what they're talking about. But you have, um, you have an organic conversation with these people peer to peer. Um, and there's lots of, the doors are wide open. This myth that it's closed is ridiculous. It's closed because you haven't thought about them. You've been thinking about yourself. And you don't either, don't have it in the, on the script yet. And you need to, you know, spend more time developing the craft. Or um, you actually have a quality project, but you're selfish in the way that you're um, approaching people. And you're annoying them. You know, you're like a telemarketer or whatever. Um, it's not going to work, you know. But if you charm your way, you know, you can even, there's a guy that hit me up on Twitter who, um, he technically made all the wrong decisions in terms of how to query me. And I tell people how to do it in, and when, I, when I work with them. And there's very specific ways that have a very high success rate. This guy did all the wrong ways. <laughs> you know, he was completely talking about himself, me, 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 my project, whatever. But he was so damn charming in the way he did it. I was like, all right, I'll give him a pass. I started talking to him and, you know, ended up, you know, um, ended up working with him. So, um charm is the most important thing, but like, and it can even overcome bad form, but like, there are just simple ways of, again, getting back to this idea of it all being easy. You know, people are like, oh, and I quit. I knew this one writer who thousands of query letters and it was partly, and, and got like sort of no response. And partly because he, um, he just had that old school approach. I'm just gonna shotgun it to all these people and I'm gonna talk about all my, I gotta establish credibility. So I did this and I won this festival, blah, blah, blah. And it's just noise. It's just noise. Nobody wants to hear that. But everybody wants to have good conversations. So you, you wanna to talk to anybody in Hollywood, look them up online, see what they're talking about, get in, organically get into a conversation with them by talking about what they're already tweeting about on Twitter or whatever their charity is or whatever they already love. Um, and let it be organic, don't be attached to it, let it be easy, and I guarantee you, if they are, are true kindred spirits, you will find something to talk about, and then at the right time, they'll go, wow, you're fascinating, what are you working on? Oh, glad you asked. <laughs> and then you pitch. But can charm really be taught? Because there's some really bright people around here, and maybe they're just so used to being very matter-of-fact, they're not used to, I hate to say BSing, but sometimes charm can be equated to BS. And there's a, there's a, there's a time for that. Yeah. And, and, and people can do it very subtly and it works. But some people don't, they're not, they don't do charm. Yeah. What happens to those people? Um, <laughs> so um, it's a good question. And um, it's, it's not binary. It's not binary. There's not you have it or you don't. It's there's a charmometer, right? It's how far along, you know. And there's some people that are off the charts. It is super charming, and, and a lot of people in Hollywood are, are very charming in general. Absolutely, it's a mm -hmm. it's a business that attracts charisma and sort of thing. Um, but for sure, there are ways we can allow that charming, charismatic side of ourselves to be more present or less present. It's a choice. It's a practice. You can't just, you know, some people can turn it on, but some people need more practice. But um, 
it's everybody's got it, whether you're sort of geeky or bro or uh, artsy or whatever your thing is. Um, Emo. Yeah, it could be anything. It could be anything. Uh -huh. But like um, there's a side of you that's authentic and a little vulnerable and human and humble. And um, when you show up in that energy um, in service, to somebody else again. The, the I was the point that I was making before is this guy was so charming that even using the wrong form, he got my interest. What I'm saying is, you can actually just even have average level charm, and if you use the, my my approach, you're going to get doors opening e easily if you've got the goods. What happens is most people um, most people are asking me, "How do I try out for the Yankees?" I'm like, "Oh, you want to try out for the Yankees, huh? What minor league baseball team are you on? Oh, minors? I have to do that first? No, no, yeah, dude, you can't. You're not going to make the Yankees. You, can, you first go try out for a minor league team, crush it in the minors, and now you have a shot at the Yankees. But that's exactly what I get when people are hitting me up. They're going, "Well, how do I? I got. I just, I just wrote a script. How do I sell it?" I'm like, "Well." You might be able to sell it. It might be great. Why don't you submit to a couple contests and see how you stack up? And maybe it is. Maybe it's the best thing I've ever read. But chances are, if it's the first thing you wrote, the second thing you wrote, you know, you're not ready for the majors yet, probably. And it's the same way. It's like if you're gonna, you want to play baseball, you don't be like, you know, I was really good in high school. I'm gonna go play in the majors. I mean, maybe some phenomenal players can play at 18, but like, you know, you. Amateur writers don't realize levels, and they don't they don't quite realize that they're. They're competing against professionals, you know, professionals that are at the game. You know, in in fact, in the major leagues, you know, you've only got this short window of time when you can play in the majors, right? But like the professional writing game, you know, you can be 20 years old, you're competing against me, you're competing against 70 year olds, you're competing against lead, you're competing against everybody that's alive and can breathe and sort of think. So it's a wide pool, and you have to bring your game. Um, by understanding those levels and understanding where you really are um, and then moving forward. And it's not a bad thing. It's not a big deal to be like, okay, yeah, I'm here and I'm on this part of the road. Who cares? Because you know what? At some point, if you stay with it, you will become professional. And okay, that's fine. And then um, it's all the process anyway. So it really doesn't matter that much um, that uh, it doesn't matter that much um, where you are along the road. But for damn sure it matters that if you're at the early part of your journey, you're not thinking that you're someplace else. You know? And on the flip side, after you've won an Oscar, after you've had a box office success, after you've had whatever, you can't then get so arrogant that think that you know it all and you're not still learning. That's where that sophomore slump comes in. That's where all that problem comes in. It's the same problem that the beginner has. They're not in the flow. They're not feeling their superpower and leading from their superpower. They're doing it enough to get in and then they get some sort of success and they stop doing it and they fall off the cliff. Explain to me data point in, in terms of screenwriting. So the, when I say data point, I just mean um, the numbers. So if you talk about going to 10 places in the industry that has the potential to advance your career, um, it's, you know, it's a way, calling it a data point is a way of sort of draining out the emotion of it because, you know, I was uh, helping with this one screenplay contest once and it was amazing because somebody didn't, <laughs> the, screen, the screenwriter, um, he didn't, his script didn't make it to the corner finals and his response was, go F yourself. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> which, is, which is such a, such a ridiculous, it's so ridiculous on so many levels. Um, and to the point that I'm trying to make here is it's ridiculous because um, it's just one, it's one data point. It doesn't matter. When any screenplay you know, contest doesn't reject, that, that you should, the sooner you forget about it that it, they didn't advance your screenplay, the better off you are. You're only looking for at least three out of 10, which means seven out of 10 are gonna close a door. And as soon as you find out they close your door, just forget about it, it doesn't matter. And certainly when you get a door closed in your face and your feelings are hurt, don't tell the people about it like you were a child and you were petulant um, because this is a small town. Everybody knows everybody. And um, I mean, you know, nobody's really going to care. And I don't even know what that guy's name was. And I don't care. But like on the scale of like emotional maturity, <laughs> um, you know, emailing a festival that you didn't get into or whatever and telling them to F off, that's pretty much the, the worst response you could, you could have to um, show that you have the emotional maturity to, to do well in this business. 
Do you think rejection is like a muscle and that it, it's just you learn that eventually like it's it just doesn't it doesn't it, it hurt as much if somebody punches somebody's arm it, it's almost like just the weaker arms gonna, it's gonna ooh, but then after a while you, you build it up yes and, and i would even say the word rejection is loaded with something bad the better way to think about it is um uh it's just part of the process you, you're either winning this way or you're winning that way um oh i thought my script was really good but i submitted it to the blacklist and i only got a two. Oh, that's interesting what was it that those professional readers saw differently than what i thought because i thought it was amazing um, and then you go in and you figure out how to close the gap. So where's the loss? There's no loss, there's no rejection. It's all part of the process. Do you believe every screenplay a screenwriter writes begins with their five favorite movies? Um, no, um, and they're probably better off leaning into their favorite films to inspire what's next for them um, because our favorite scripts, our favorite films or shows, depending on what we're, what we're writing, um, spoke to us in a deep way. Um, because let's, I mean, let's look at this. Uh, there's tens of thousands of movies and shows that we could have watched in our lifetime. lifetime. You know, 1% of them or whatever we've actually seen. So thousands of people, thousands of movies and shows, thousands of hours for sure. If you, you get to the point where you're writing a screenplay, you've probably seen, you know, thousands of hours of, of, of content. So of that, let's say it's a thousand just for hypothetical, which are the favorites and why are those the favorites? And then when you get down to the specificity of my favorite seven films, it's not gonna be like anybody else's favorite seven on the planet. So you're talking about a very specific, almost code of what speaks to me. And if you take a look at that, there's connective tissue um, in terms of theme or character arc or genre um, or just feel or tone or things. And it, it's, um, I found very instructive for me and for writers that I mentor to use that as the well. I mean, this is what, they could have picked anything, right? They could have, you know, but the ones that they saw and of the ones they saw, these are the ones that sort of stirred their soul. So why would you not use that as a resource to say, this is what I love most, and now I'm gonna do my version of that? Sure, what if we're at a risk of, of putting too many, let's say we're taking from Black Swan, or we're taking the, you know, from the opening of Forrest Gump, or what, you know, we're, we're infusing too many things that have already been done, and people can spot that and say, yeah, you were, that, that's, Derivative. Right. We, we, we recognize so, that. So the um, what we're always looking for is the same but different. If, we're, um, if it's too much the same, like you're talking about, then it feels too derivative. It, it, it's boring, right? If it's too different, um, it just, it's just too kind of weird. It's too idiosyncratic and it's like whatever, right? Um, the stuff that's speaking to you most deeply has a beautiful balance of the same but different, someplace right in the middle. And when I create my new version of the same but different, um, <laughs> that's where the magic is. I mean, that's where the really profound beauty is. Um, if I try to do that and it's feeling derivative, then I've just leaned over to this pole too much and I need to go, oh, okay, I'm, I'm borrowing too much from my favorite stuff. How do I make it more personal to me? What was going on in my life that inspired me to like that movie? What is it that, you know, so if you look at something like Star Wars, right? None of us were starfighters or, or uh, you, know, you know, what do you call him? Um, he's a, a, a fighter pilot or whatever it was um, for the rebellion. But like the way, like in, in episode four, I'm talking about the way that he um, interacted with his, his family, his aunt and uncle, and the way he kind of was like, you know, had to do his chores. And then um, he had this calling to go on this adventure to face the, uh, the empire. Um, we relate to that because if we do, if, if we relate to that, we're related because we feel similar things in our own sort of experience, right? So, um, so if, Episode four is on my list of favorite movies. Um, 
you know, you might take that it's sci-fi from it. You might take that it's a hero's journey story. You might take that it's um, that he kind of had this mundane sort of teenager type life and it was called for some more sort of adventure. There's different things that you can take. And if I take X from it and I'm putting it in my screenplay and I'm getting a reaction from people I respect who are going, yeah, this feels like it's too close to Star Wars, then it's like, okay, that's interesting. How do I make it more personal to me? You know, because what I'm probably not doing is going deep enough into what I love about this, that material. Can I give this a try with some of my favorite movies? One of them being Forrest Gump. I mean, I can speak to Forrest Gump okay, somewhat. Let's talk I, mean, about it. Um, I mean, I saw it when it came out, but it's such an iconic film, so I have some thoughts on it. Um, if that were on um, uh, somebody's list of favorite movies, you know, you might take a. Again, it's. To, the thing is to look at the, the whole series, right? Um, if you look at Seven, and if, and if let's say all of them were fairly similar to, to Forrest Gump, um, there's a there's a playfulness in that. There's an innocence. It's sort of um, I mean Blake would call it the full triumphant story, um, and so I would you know I would look at that type of story. Um, I would look at um, the type of protagonist that was sort of a special needs protagonist. This idea that life is nothing but a box of chocolate. So that's a thematic idea that might speak to you. Um, the setting it was like in the South, right, in like Georgia or someplace or Alabama. Um, so I would take those elements and just note them. So it's a soft, easy process. And then list your other six favorite movies. Um, and then you start looking about like, are there any other movies that are full triumphant type movies from Blake Snyder's process, or any other movies that are sort of set in the South, or any other movies about um, characters that had special needs? Or any other movies that have thematic idea of sort of you know um, uh, you know like 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 life is like a box of chocolates or whatever that was or um, you know they talked about there was sort of nostalgia stuff going on in there too so you just take the pieces and you start looking through it so um, and then you will see connective tissues and you'll realize I'm drawn to these things for really deep reasons and when you come with your new material you create your new material from those deeper reasons. It's almost certainly going to be more resonant, more singular, and you are speaking to that as a creative authority on what you love the most because those are your favorite damn movies and you can talk about them all day long as an authority. And so when you come from that sort of swagger and love and passion, that's exactly what Hollywood is looking for. They're looking for you to be the creative leader on your sensibility because that's what we're doing when we tell a story. We're leading millions of people on this journey from here to there. And we can't do it unless we're comfortable and confident about what our sensibility is. So listing your favorites and analyzing them is a way of sort of making, you already know what those are, but you're bringing it to a conscious level to go, yeah, I'm, I love these things and here's why I love them and I can talk about them with authority. And from that authority, you put that on the page and then it crackles in your own unique way and speaks to other people. About uh, Russell Crowe and I'm forgive me the name. It's where he's the tobacco insider. Insider. The insider. Oh, yeah. I love Fan that film. Fantastic. Yeah. So if that was on the same list as um, uh, Forrest Gump, so one connection I'm seeing um, with that movie is you have, you know, also kind of the both of them have like this innocent kind of flustered um, main character. I mean, well. Yeah, the, you know, Tom Hanks' character isn't flustered, but he runs and <laughs> like crazy, he doesn't stop running. But the the um, the Russell Crowe character is totally flustered and overwhelmed, and and so to me, those are very significant. So if those were two of your favorites, I would say there's something about being sort of in over your head, uh, less, um, you know, sort of that fish out of water thing, but like, um, but just sort of innocently kind of stumbling into something and like it being like a really big deal. Um, so those to me are pretty significant. And um, with Insider, there's also, I mean, that's politically charged. Um, it's socially, social issue charged. Um, that one is, is grounded to Michael Mann, um, perhaps at his best, one of my favorites from him. And you got Pacino, who's um, this, you know, dynamic um, sort of crusader, uh, and you have that beautiful scene in the courtroom of um, 
so good that well, that one actor, I don't know his name, but he's in that courtroom scene and he just, he sticks to the tobacco company. He was just basically like, look, you knew this was wrong. You did it anyway and it's now gonna stop. You can't push us, you can't bully us anymore. So it's that, that bullying thing. So maybe that's the theme in you. So again, those are just two movies. If you brought out the other five, you can start seeing some really significant connective tissue. Um, and then if you, you can almost see it like a Lego set, right? You're the Lego set of your favorite movies and then you take that same Lego set and then you create your own new movie with those same Legos and maybe you add a few new ones. But like you are much more likely to, to write something that is so connected to like your soul for the reason that you came to the planet, that the, the thing that like, who else are we gonna to go to about those movies but you because they're your favorite movies? You can teach anybody something about those movies because you're a favorite. So that's sort of the way that I help people get aligned with their superpower or where I do it myself for my own work. If I get a little bit kind of um, confused about something or a resistance, I'm like, well, how are they doing it in my favorite movies? And I kind of look at that <clears throat> and I learn and I go, okay, well, they did this and they did this and they did this. And I go, well, I'm doing this, this, and this. And then it's like, okay, well, how do I make those dots connect? How do I connect apples to apples with my favorites? Um, and, and then once I do it for me, I give it to somebody else and I go, are they seeing it? You know, because if, if it's just me, if I'm a professional, it can't be just me. It's got to be eliciting the reaction of the other people too, which is even more fun anyway. <laughs> Can you explain the three elements of creating a horror movie? Yeah, it's a great question. That comes from Blake Snyder's idea about the monster in the house. Because Blake has this really wonderful, elegant way of thinking about genre that's different than the way most people think about genre. When most people think about genre, they think of sci-fi or Western or horror or this or that or the other. And Blake was like, well, that doesn't really help you write a screenplay. What's a way of thinking about genre, a way of sort of unified elements that's going to keep you focused on what's ma what matters for you to um, create a screenplay with core elements that has like a tuning fork that sounds like wonderful expression of that genre. So um, one of my favorites is that monster in, in the house genre and, and that requires a monster of some sort, right? Um, but it need not be like supernatural. It could even be like a psychopath or, or you know, um, something terrible. Um, and then a house that's, um, that's confined the protagonist so that it's, um, so that they can't get away, right? So that the monster is chasing them because if uh, there's no house, then there's no tension, right? The stakes are there because they can't get away from the monster because they're stuck in the house together. And then the most fascinating part about it is the sin. That's the third part. And the why is sin? And it's because um, monster, monster in the House movies are a morality tale of when, we, when you do something bad, bad things happen. So, uh, you know, the classic, um, you know, kids, teenagers go into the woods to have pre premarital sex. Well, then the bad thing's going to happen. The slasher is going to come out and kill them, right? Um, but without that sin, they're just kind of, you know, two, a couple walking their dog by the woods and they get killed. It doesn't quite, doesn't quite hit us in that same way um, because we're all attracted to sin and we all sin to some degree or another. And so um, Monster in the House stories play on that vice choice and terrible response. And that's part of the titillation of great horror. Um, and... What's also really wonderful about what Blake thought about in that theory is that he then said, if you look at a movie like Jaws, um, where the monster is the shark and the contained, the house is the, is the island where, you know, where the sort of the, the Amity Island, which was sort of like the Hamptons, but like, you know, this contained place. Um, and then the sin was that um, they knew the threat was there, but they didn't shut down the town or didn't keep people away from the beach because it was a tourist town and they needed the money or they wanted the money. The greed was the sin. So <clears throat> that makes the, that's such an interesting story and compelling in a different way than if it didn't have that element. But then Blake really ingeniously said a movie like Fatal Attraction, he would also put in that monster in the house thing. It's what, you know, certainly Jaws is like a horror movie, but how would you, Fail attractions like this kind of psychological thriller. 
But let's look at the three elements. You've got um, the monster, which is Glenn Close, playing the psychopathic woman who just um, was obsessed uh, with this guy. Um, you've got the house was, literally the end was the house, but it was really kind of the family unit, right? And the sin was adultery. So you have that same primal pattern of you know, wanting something that you really shouldn't go after and you do it anyway and it brings out the monster and then all hell breaks loose. Great example. So that doesn't necessarily have to be a horror film. It can be a thriller. It could be a drama. Um, I mean, did you see Dark Waters? I didn't see Dark Waters. Oh, okay. All right. We won't go into that one. Yeah. But it, 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 can, it absolutely can transcend what traditionally we think of as genres. It could be sci-fi, Western. It could be anything. Um, the key is... To Blake's mind, which I thought was really great, was that core pattern. You're gonna chances of making a writing a script that makes a deeper impact on people is is much more likely if you take those three elements and you sort of build your story around those elements, no matter what sort of external genre you'd place on it. Does every genre have a certain amount of elements a writer must know? Yeah, yeah, they do. It's um, because what we're, what we're doing is we're taking the audience on a very personal journey, even if it's a comedy or whatever it is. Um, and the genre is the set of expectations that the audience is, has been promised for them to plunk down their money to see the story. So if I promise them a comedy and it's not funny, they're going to be pissed off and rightly so. Um, if it's a horror movie, uh, it's got to be scary. If it's a thriller, it has to have tension. Um, and uh, so a lot of beginning writers don't realize that. They're not seeing it as a relationship with the audience with these promises. And genres are all about promises and expectations. And sometimes um, Beginning writers will go, oh, I've got this cool idea and it's kind of this genre and it's kind of more that genre and it's kind of like that. And it's like, yeah, that's really creative. And um, you are planning to <laughs> alienate your audience um, and it almost never works. Um, there's some genres that can kind of um, play nice together. Um, uh, you know, one that a lot of people try to do but very, very rarely get, get right is like horror comedy. Um, Edgar Wright, I think, does it masterfully, better than anybody that I've seen. But it's really hard, and it's really hard because comedy is so particular, and so the comedy has to be great. Um, and then the, the amount of fear and the scares has to be great. So you're talking about two really high bars that are particular. That's why most don't work well. And I think that, getting back to the other point, is that just early screenwriters, sometimes when I, when I work with screenwriters, they... Um, it's one of the ways that their creativity gets in, in the way. That they, um, they, it's like they, um, they're building a car and they put triangle wheels on the car. And um, it, the, the car is not going to go. It is going to be super creative. It's going to be really cool. And, and I honor them for coming up with those ideas. But um, it's not going to get them to where they want to go. So um, there's ways where you just... You know, don't you know, take the round wheel. You can make a big round wheel or a small round wheel, but make it a round wheel. Um, and then the creativity on top of that, then you can go wild. So there's, um, yeah, that's a common problem that earlier writers have. They don't know which boxes can be totally crazy and need to be crazy and, 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 and different and which boxes are really more like an engineering problem. They just don't mess with that. And genre is, is absolutely one of those ones where you generally don't mess with it. You go, you give them what they want and give them a spin on it, but it's really what they want. Um, you know, even Tarantino, um, who has a deep understanding of, of movies and genre, you know, one of his, I think, least successful movies was um, From Dusk Till Dawn that he made with Robert Rodriguez. And I think it was just because it was, it was a, a horror crime film and it started, literally started out as I think more of a crime film and then took this crazy left turn into a vampire movie, um, which <laughs> even just saying it, it sounds like one of those, hey, wouldn't it be cool if there was a movie? And then it was like this and then these vampires came out, you know. And um, 
you know, those guys were at a point in their career where they were killing it. And um, they were like, yeah, this is really cool. And they loved it. And, you know, and people, you know, uh, I don't know if it was profitable. Probably it might have been profitable or, or not. I don't think it was. Um, or maybe over time it became profitable. But like ultimately, I think it's a really good case study of an interesting idea, um, but a fairly low ceiling in terms of how many people are really going to love it. And I'm sure some people are like, I love that movie. It's my favorite. Okay, great. Um, and if your objective is to deliver your voice in service to your audience as powerfully as possible for as broad of an audience as possible, um, stick to one genre and nail that genre and go take that genre to the new place. Give it a fresh spin on where it's going next. The audience gaining trust, the screenwriter gaining trust of their audience, is is it different than this genre promise? No, it's the same. The one way to establish trust with the audience is if I, you know, I've shown them a log line and it's this particular genre and on page one they're seeing that it already feels like this genre on page one, now I'm establishing more trust. And if I'm paid, if I'm if it's a comedy and there's nothing funny on page one, problems. And what about this, I hate to call it self-delusion, but I'll just use that for lack of a better term, of a writer thinking they're taking genre to new heights, but they're not really doing that. They're mixing it, they're, they're playing with it in ways that really aren't taking it to new heights. So I, I love that question because um, it, to me, it feels like their intention is dead on and the execution is a mess. <laughs> so um, if they have a high quality feedback loop system, um, it will tell them, you know, it'll be like, look, I want to, I think I'm going to have some action and I'm going to have some comedy and I'm going to have some of this, I'm going to have that. And um, the, the response to, to that sort of thing is like, look, this is, it's kind of like a little bit of a lot of things, and I'd rather have a lot of one thing um, if they're getting high quality feedback. Um, and then that person can go, huh, because I thought it was kind of cool. Okay, well, I'm going to make it anyway if I'm an independent filmmaker, and then it'll play regional festivals or whatever, um, or not, not at all. But like, if you want to blow people away, then you do sort of less from a deeper place. Um, and you fulfill that promise of genre of these other things in a way that's profound and feels fresh and new. So it's the same but different. It's familiar but fresh. Um, and uh, yeah, genre is, is one of the best ways to do it. And so the person that's kind of like in that scatter place or they've got all these mishmashes, um, Again, it's fine, you know, but they just have to just compare the apples to apples. I'm trying to, you know, here's a comparable. Again, they're, if they compare one apple that they're trying to do with four different apples, that's the problem, right? No, give, tell me one movie that had this particular genre that you love, that was successful, that you, you'd love to have that sort of success with your screenplay. What's that apple? Now you create your apple and then you figure out how you sort of can make them the same. So uh, Quentin Tarantino tells this great story about when he was acting in the 80s and uh, he had this acting, and at that point in the 80s, you know, you couldn't get, there was no internet, so you had to, couldn't get scripts online. You had to kind of like watch the movies and, you know, take notes. And so he's in this acting class and he, um, you know, wrote down the scene from this movie and handed it to his acting partner and goes, like, you know, we're going to act in this, in this scene together. And, um, and the scene, the right scene partner goes, well, hold on a second, this monologue isn't in the movie. And Quentin's like, what? Oh, geez, I'm sorry. He goes, no, 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 this is better than what's in the movie, right? <laughs> and so um, the takeaway there for the, for the amateur writer is um, what he did inadvertently was realize that he as a writer was nailing at a really high level. So um, amateur writers can use, or any writer can, I use it all the time to sort of compare apples to apples with any sort of element. If I'm trying to get better at, let's say, tension or, you know, certain dialogue or genre or whatever, I look at what I think is the standard for what I'm trying to do in another thing, and then I do my version of it, and I try to get the apple to the apple to be the same in my view, and then I get feedback. 
And are they looking at it and going, yeah, Brooks, I can't tell which one was written by you and which one was written by, you know, Legend A or whatever. Now, now I'm good. It's like fan fiction almost. He was doing an early version of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That was a good way to look at it. That's exactly it. And if you can do fan fiction that's as good, um, you know, I, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's, you, can, you can get work that way if you can play in that universe in a way that's as powerful as the, you know, the people that are already there. Sure. So if I'm writing, let's say, a thriller and I think, oh, wow, I'm going to really, this is this, the thriller genre, but I'm going to take it to new heights. And let's suppose it's like a Wall Street corruption story and somebody is the cleaning lady and she ends up seeing people shredding documents. But then the people that are really the bad guys turn out to be like reptilian society people. And mm -hmm. that's, I'm almost, that's not really taking it to a new height. That's mixing genres. Cause now I've got some sci-fi in there and they don't need to be reptiles. You see what I'm saying? So I'm mixing, but I, my, my assumption is I think, oh, I'm going to take this to new heights. But if I don't get that feedback from the feedback loop, then I'm going to be delusional in thinking that this has just like never been seen before. So, so what I'll say about that is, yeah, I think that the word delusional is sort of a charged word that feels a little distracting because in this hypothetical where somebody's like, I'm trying to take the genre to a new place, Perfect. That's exactly what we're doing. That's exactly what everything is that we love has done. It takes something, not everything, but a lot of things that really break ground. It's because they're doing that. So that intention is dead on. And the truth is, it takes trial and error to be able to get that. It's like, I want to make the best new heist film ever, right? Awesome. Um, that's what I'm trying to do. Where am I at now? So to say where I'm at and how is delusional. It's like, okay, fine. But like, I mean, that's kind of a negative way of saying it. It's just look, you, you are where you are, and then and then you just kind of figure out, here's what I'm trying to get to, here's where I am now, how do I sort of get there? And um, and being gentle with ourselves and thinking of ourselves or other people as like delusional is kind of a, it's a distracting way of, of the matter of fact business of getting the apple to match the apple. And if, um, and the impulse to go, the way that I'm going to take it to that next level is adding a, a bit of this genre, that genre. Um, maybe it's just you know it's it's sort of like um, you know you just you gotta get a feel for these things. You know what I mean? It's like sometimes some genres do have aspects that do play nice together, you know, or harmonize really nice together, um, and some things kind of clash. You know, there's sort of um, you know, somebody can you know, do a website design or just a set of colors and some people have a knack for like, ooh, those colors look nice together. Or, or like the way you dress, you know. Uh, <laughs> some people can do it, some people can't, some people like it, some people don't. But like, it's that set of artistic choices that harmonize together or not. And so, um, so uh, it's a matter of playing with which story elements end up harmonizing in the right way to get to the point where you're taking the genre to the next level. So I would never describe it as delusional when they're in the process of doing the damn thing that they should be doing. Brooks, we're going to give you 14 idea fragments. You don't have to use everything. You don't have to use all of them. You can throw any of them away except one. And we want to see how far you can get into the process while taking us through your process the best you can. And for those of you watching, if you want to play along at home, great, please do the same. And we welcome you to pause the video and see what you can come up with and compare your ideas to a professional writer. Okay, are we ready? I'm ready. Okay, screenwriters on your marks. So here we go, 14 idea fragments. Single mom. Single mom. $500,000. 500K. A train. A train. Memory loss. Memory loss. What? Oh, I forgot. Sorry. No joke. <laughs> a small town in Michigan. Small town, Michigan. Okay. The power of silence. Power of silence. A yellow bag. Yellow bag. A man with a checkered coat. Man with a checkered coat. Two friends who haven't seen each other in 20 years. Two friends. Who haven't seen each other in 20 years. An abandoned castle. An abandoned castle. Butchered that spelling of abandoned. That's fine. <laughs> okay. A life-threatening dare. 
a life threatening dare. A mismatched pair of detectives. A mismatched pair of detectives. Rebirth. Rebirth. And lastly, mm -hmm. this piece of dialogue. Okay. They don't realize how powerful I am. They don't realize how powerful I am. Cool. Okay, great. So the first thing um, I'm thinking about is um, what spoke to me. Like what, when I go down these prompts, it's like, what is it? Um, where, where do I feel like I might have a personal take on something, right? Single mom, um, my mom was single. So that, I feel something. 500K is a significant amount of money. Um, maybe, I mean, it's sort of, you know, heists and crass and it's sort of material and maybe. Train is a great location, certainly a big history in um, cinema history of trains or strangers on a train or um, lots of different, I actually wrote a, the first screenplay that I wrote was a, a passenger uh, that, I, I, that I sold was uh, uh, commuters on the L train in Chicago getting trapped in the blizzard uh, during an alien invasion. So, um, but I can't do that, I already wrote that one. So um, that's that memory loss um, is certainly interesting, um, but not so much to me. I'm gonna put that one aside. Um, small town, Michigan, okay, maybe. Um, certainly I spent some time in the Midwest, so that's possible, but probably more toward the end of the list. Doesn't, I, I'm more called to a train. And then you later have a location with the, um, the castle, an abandoned castle, which is kind of interesting. Um, I visited England once and um, went to see uh, a castle and it was, it's interesting. It's, what's nice about that, it's an elevated location. It's sort of just, a, it could be a warehouse, right? But it's, you know, has this history and, um, and it has all these metaphorical powers to it. So maybe there's something there. Um, the power of silence, that's interesting. Um, one of the things that makes cinema powerful is um, you can just watch what people are doing and you can, um, it can, it can hit you on a deep level. Uh, Scorsese said uh, once someplace that I really appreciated, he, he would sometimes watch his own films if they came on TV or whatever, and he turned the sound off and just kind of watch his, his shot selection, which is a really good way to focus on your subtext. What are the characters doing? What do they want? Um, also, it's a great way to make sure the scene construction is, is muscular and powerful. Um, if you had the sound off, um, could you see what the conflict was and what are they doing? So, um, yeah, so there's something there. It certainly lends itself well. A yellow bag, um, I mean, that was going to be used to pull over somebody's head to kill them. Uh, okay, otherwise, I'll feel connected to that. Man with a checker coat, that sounds like something um, potentially could be in some sort of detective piece or whatever. I'm not that called. About that, two friends who haven't seen each other in 20 years, um, I am all over that. Um, I had deep relationships with people I went to high school with, um, and childhood too, and I think it's probably pretty common, but there was the, the I, I, um, in, in NYU, my senior thesis film was about me, uh, was based on when I took my girlfriend home to my hometown, and I had really close relationships with my guy friends, and I kind of, Got myself in a situation to be choosing between my girlfriend and my guy friend and ended up winning a screenwriting award there. Um, so that's, um, to me, that's the most loaded and interesting idea of, of everything so far, right? And who knows, maybe this is two single moms who haven't seen each other in a long time. And maybe they're on a train and maybe they're gonna rob the train for $500,000. <laughs> yeah, terrible idea, but anyway, that's just, um, that's not where I'm going, but um, single moms haven't seen each other in 20 years. I mean, I'm not a single mom, so I wouldn't go too far into that as my protagonist, probably. Um, I can, I write women. <laughs> they're half of the people, on, they're half the characters in all my screenplays, so I can. Um, but like these days, me being a white straight male, um, writing a single mom-driven movie is, 
you know, there's resistance there. Um, and it's, it's other people's story. So um, uh, the son of a single mom, like that, that I get, that's personal to me. Um, but this, these two friends who haven't seen each other 20 years, they meet on a train, is definitely something that is speaking to me. Let's see, single mom, maybe, um, actually maybe one of them is traveling with their single mom, that feels personal to me. Um, and maybe they're going to see this abandoned castle in London, right? Or outside of London. So now what I'm doing is I'm taking these elements and I'm connecting to uh, things that have happened in my life that I could bring out authenticity with. I could um, make them something that, it's like, my, what's my personal way in? When I write with this one writing partner, um, you know, his superpower is sort of creativity and inventiveness and he loves sci-fi and fantasy. My superpower is grounded characters, pers the grounded personal characters, and I write tension that's really thick, um, generally in dramas or thrillers. So when I write with him, it's like, where's the double filter? What, what do we both um, like? What do we both speak to? So, um, uh, and so sometimes when we're looking at fragments, it's sort of, you know, when he and I are maybe brainstorming new concepts, or when I brainstorm myself, I kind of take fragment ideas and I kind of start. And if he and I, I guess the reason I brought it up is if he and I are disagreeing about something, he like kind of likes something, I go, yeah, but I don't have any personal connection to it. Um, and then we go, okay, fine, we'll go to the next one, or vice versa. So that's what I'm looking for here when I'm seeing these fragment ideas. It's like, well, what's my, what's my personal connection to it? Um, if I'm in a general meeting with a producer or something, and they're like, I got this book, and we're thinking about bringing in a writer to adapt it or whatever, um, I go, great, let me hear it. And I'm looking for some sort of connection because... Um, I can make it sing when I'm writing about this dude I went to high school with who fascinates me. You know, that, that's really what I'm writing about and I'm just sort of doing it in this certain way that kind of connects. So, um, okay, a life-threatening dare. Um, probably not, a dare doesn't interest me. Um, putting that at the bottom of the list. Um, next to yellow bag, which I won't use. A mismatched pair of detectives. Well, that's sort of, if I was, Working with like a producer who was like, I want to do a movie and it's got to have a mismatch pair of detectives. <laughs> uh, all right, I might, you know, it's part of the, you know, like maybe these two friends, they meet on the train, they haven't seen each other in 20 years and something terrible happens on the train. Maybe it, it stops in the middle of the woods or something and um, they have to be a mismatched pair of detectives to figure out what the hell happened. Um, you know, I'm just kind of, I'm, there's two things I'm doing. I'm, I'm trying to say what, what is it that I can bring something to from my perspective on life? Um, and then how do these elements sort of piece that together? But the key is not to force it, right? A mismatched pair, you know, in that element in general, mismatched pair detective feels a little, you know, a little forced to me. Um, but it can be really fascinating because detectives are interesting if you're doing any sort of mystery story. And mismatch is always good because you know, we all have poles inside of us, part of us that's this and part of us that's that. And, you know, any sort of buddy love story, what Blake Snyder would call, has p these two different characters learning from each other. So maybe, you know, these detectives are puzzle pieces that need to learn how to f fit together. So that's possible. Um, that's possible. Rebirth, I mean, that's kind of a theme. Um, uh, sure. Um, you know, we all have rebirths times, but I wouldn't really force a theme that much at this point, I don't think. Man with a checker coat, we're back to, and then um, they don't realize how powerful I am. Um, I mean, there's definitely some juice there. You could do something with that line in a certain way. Um, um, it's kind of a heartbreaking way to take it if you, um, if the character really doesn't believe it. Um, the character is in this place of going, I'm not enough, I'm not good enough, whatever, um, and says, they don't realize how powerful I am, but doesn't mean it at all. You know, um, the subtext of that is really beautiful and heartbreaking. And that would maybe, um, yeah, anyway. So, um, so yeah, I mean, that's so, you know, that's, that's a little bit, about uh, 10 minutes. So this is how I would approach it. So I'm kind of, I basically um, reorganize the list and put the ones that were like, the ones that I had some sort of connection to more towards the top and towards the bottom. And for the hypothetical, if I was going to go for, further, I would just, you know, if first, you know, I mean, that's not how it works. I mean, what will work in the business is they'll say, I've got this story and maybe it has some of these elements. 
Um, I mean, it might, you know, it might, there might be some sort of novel that has those sort of elements, but this is sort of missing the narrative drive or something, So, um, which is, tends to be more the core part of a story, which is why if somebody would option a book or something. Um, but like, um, does that answer your question in terms of how I would think about these things? In terms of putting them into a story, like if you were to take some of these pieces, mm -hmm. um, whether you use just one, what if you just, all you did was was build it around the two friends who hadn't seen each other in 20 years. Okay. You just said, okay, I'm gonna take that. And you know that that resonates with you because you have close relationships with people from your hometown. Yeah. And so okay. you can so, go somewhere. With so you want me to come up with a concept uh, based on um, one of these pieces? Sure. And if one, if one, and if you say, you know what, actually, this yellow bag. What if one of them finds five hundred thousand in a yellow bag, mm -hmm. and now they have a moral dilemma? Yeah. Do I turn it in? What do I do? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Um, well, I'll pitch an idea that um, these two friends are on a train and they haven't seen each other in um, twenty years, and. Um, um, maybe they had a history of some some bad things back in high school that they did. Maybe not too bad, but like some trouble. Um, and one guy's desperate, and he's got an, uh, an opportunity to steal five hundred thousand dollars from X, right? So, um, and he hasn't seen this guy in twenty years, and he knows at least back the way he was before that like. This guy is, is the perfect guy. It's almost like Strangers in a Train, which is the premise there of the Hitchcock story was, um, I'll do your murder, you do my murder, and that way we have no alibi and, and we're, both, um, we're both more likely to get away with it. So maybe I would pitch this as a spin on that, but it's not, um, I mean, Hitchcock was great, but he also had a very kind of, you know, bulky, boxy sort of stiff, you know, performances and kind of, you know, it was just older, different, different time. Um, but if it was like a um, yeah a modern story, two friends that haven't seen each other, and this one guy's already has this heist in mind, um, and desperately needs his five hundred dollars, and runs into this friend and is like, oh my god, this guy's the perfect guy to do it, and then what's what's the blocking agent? Why is um, is it the guy? You know, um, like maybe even like maybe one guy's a dirty cop. Right, so one guy's a dirty cop, and and the guy that sees him is now a criminal, and maybe he's trying to recruit. One guy's trying to recruit the other for some sort of heist or something. Um, these guys were best friends in high school, and um, so what we're, what I'm doing is I'm I'm sort of pitting sort of deeper personal elements in a way that f could feel kind of personal. Not that I've ever robbed anything or anything like that, but like um, loyalties among friends and taking some sort of risk for a heist experience is pretty. Compelling. I like high stories. I like I like crime stories. So um, yeah. So I could see that as sort of a. I mean, it's kind of a low, low. Uh, you know, there's high concept. There's low concept. Um, but you know, it's it's okay. It's it's interesting. So if you were to. So if if let's say that's the story. So let's say um, uh, I'll write a log line out of it. When when two friends two. They were not kind of, what kind of friends? They were um, outsiders. They were um, two kind of <laughs> down and out friends. One's a cop, maybe called down and out friends. Um, one cop and one crook who haven't seen each other in 20 years um, meet on a train. Um, they decide to team up to steal $500,000, right? So that's functional. Um, but like, so that's like, and that's actually where a lot of sort of beginning writers might stop, right? Okay, they do it. And then the, but the problem is if you don't go any further with that concept, um, it's just flat. It's sort of like, I mean, you have to, that dialogue would have to be phenomenal and crackling and amazing. Um, so what really makes this better as a concept is, well, who are these friends? Is, is one's a cop? What type of cop is he? How, how dirty is he? And then, um, and if it's like this thing where the, the, the crook needs to, the cop for one thing, and the cop needs a crook for one thing, and then there's these loyalties that are at play, and who knows, maybe, um, you know, 
Maybe they stopped being friends because one guy hooked up with his girlfriend back in high school. Um, and then that comes up at a climatic part where the one guy never really effing forgave him for it. Um, you know, um, you know, I could, I could write a story like that. I mean, again, if it doesn't feel, I mean, I'm looking at it for 17 minutes now, but like, um, uh, but this is the process. I would go into it and I would say, what, and, and I, and if I was, I would, so first of all, I wouldn't put a ticking, ticking clock on it. I would kind of play with it for a little bit and then I would sit down and set it down and I'd go someplace else. And then when I was in the shower or whatever, it might come to me and go, okay, what if, what if this happened with this guy? And then what if that happened? And I would play with it. And then I would get it to a point where, um, you know, I felt like, okay, is this something that's kind of interesting? And then I would pass it around to my feedback circle, say, what do you guys think? Is this, um, you know, uh, I might have them rate it from one to 10. Um, I might just pitch it to them and then look at the response. And if, um, again, I, you know, step one would be me getting to a place like, that I feel like, ooh, I'm really excited. To me right now, what I put together is rudimentary. It's like level six out of 10 as a, sort of concepts. Right, um, it's much easier if you start a new script and it's like a level nine concept, or a level ten concept, right? Which is unlikely for you know most people to do when they're sitting at looking at something for fifteen minutes. But that's the thing is we you know we don't have fifteen minutes; we have as much time as we want. <laughs> so um, I would just keep going back to the well and playing with it and go, what about this? What about that? And then you know if I ever felt a little forced, and just put it away and then just just do something else. Um, and then once I got it up to a point where I felt like. Ooh, this is actually really great. And, and also the other thing that I'd be looking for that's really good that I got from Blake Snyder is irony. So where could you add some irony to the story? So two down and out friends, one's a cop, one's a crook. They haven't seen each other in 20 years. They meet on a train. Um, one guy realizes that he's super desperate and he's got a shot at stealing 500,000 bucks and his friend from high school is the perfect accomplice. But yeah. They, you know, one guy slept with this, <laughs> they, they stopped talking 20 years ago because one guy slept with his girlfriend and um, they got to deal with that. Or maybe that's got to be dealt with up front. And then he goes, okay, we'll do it. And that breaks into, sec into your second act. Um, and then as we go deeper, you know, why did he sleep with the girlfriend? What did they really love about each other um, that was betrayed back then? You know, what, what do they really need as people? Um, and then the movie really becomes about uh, you know, I don't know if it comes about a re rebirth, but it comes about them sort of. Because I had deep friendships in high school. I mean, these guys, I love these guys because partly because my father wasn't around as much as I wanted him to be. So I have abandonment stuff. So one way that I dealt with that abandonment stuff was having really tight friendships. So um, uh, my friends and I did not sleep with each other's girlfriends. <laughs> but, um, you know, there's betrayals of different sorts or whatever, but I would sort of tap into that thing and it would probably have to do with some, if I was gonna write this, sort of develop it, and I had to use those elements, I would start playing around this idea of abandonment and how I dealt with abandonment and how these guys have dealt with abandonment and what do they do about it. And um, yeah, so that's kind of, that's, that's what I got. I mean, that's sort of my process in you know, looking at it for 20 minutes. Um, you know, how I would approach it, why would I, I would approach it that way. Um, and at the level that I got to this, uh, what I will say is, A, this is like I said, <clears throat> I don't know, 60%, 70%. It feels like it's, it's there. If it's what would make this from just being an, an exercise to something like, ooh, this is amazing. I want to really write this at some point. Probably another element or two. Maybe there's a sense of irony that I could bring into it, or maybe a way to elevate it. Maybe it doesn't take place sort of modern day, but maybe it takes place on the moon or the International Space Station or something, or it takes place in like the 1860s, and I'm in a place where I really want to, you know, explore that sort of thing. Um, uh, but what I'm looking for is that personal connection to it, something that I feel like, yeah. I'm on the planet to do this, you know? And then another thing I would do early on is going, okay, well, what is it like? Okay, it's sort of like Strangers on the Train, but like, you know, I admire stuff about that, but that doesn't really speak to me. Um, now, Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid, the Peckinpah film from 72 or 73, that blows me away, and that's about friendship and betrayal. So maybe I do that, maybe I go in and go, okay, two friends who haven't seen each other, and maybe it's sort of like with Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid, they were, outlaws together and then they were pitted against each other. 
Um, so maybe I would do that. I would kind of milk what I love from that comparable, and I would go, okay, how would Peck and Paul do this? How would this happen? Um, so, um, and again, the key is not forcing it. So I would never put a 20, 20 minute um, or whatever, never put a time limit. I would, I would just get in there and play around, and I'd get to the point where if it was fun to keep playing, I would. And if it stopped being fun, I'd just do something else, uh, maybe with a different story, maybe whatever. Um, and if I was in a meeting with a producer and they were pitching this idea, it would still be the same thing. It's like, you know, I either can bring uh, something to what this, you know, the guy's vision is for what he wants to do, whether it's an original or an adaptation or something, um, or I can't. And um, I'm not attached to either outcome. You know, because it's, that's the thing, it's because it's, it exists beyond me. It's like I'm not even, it's not me. The more I think it's like me, my screenplay, blah, blah, blah. It's like that just gets in the way. What I'm doing is trying to be in service to the audience that would want to see this. Let's say it's a crime thriller or a heist film. And, um, and if I am the man to serve them with these sort of ideas that just came to me and they're in service, great. You know, and you want to pay me a lot of money for that, awesome. And, um, and I'm, not, I'm not attached to any of it. But you were able to find things that you emotionally plugged into, even if it was just 60, 70 percent there, like the man with the checkered coat. You were like, eh, yeah, whatever. Abandoned castle. Yeah, I've been to one. It was kind of cool. It was eerie. But it wasn't something that you really felt like maybe a deep connection with. But the two friends yeah. that hadn't seen each other, mm -hmm. that really. Uh, and why is because my personal life. My psychology, my psyche was formed around this abandonment issue. My my dad, took, uh, you know, my parents split when I was in third grade. My dad died when I was seventeen. So I dealt with abandonment as a core issue um, my whole life, and so I have world class insights about how to deal with abandonment in good ways and in bad ways and everything in between. So. Um, you know, you got abandonment issues, you come to me and I'll, you know, we'll have a good conversation. And my <laughs> stories, um, when they come from that place now, you know what I mean? Now it's like, it, it makes some sense, right? Um, and I can touch on other things, but like that's, that was a core one for me. So that's why those friendships meant so much to me. Um, and I mean, and it was like, and I would, not only I had a c group of friends in high school, but I had like best friends and we were like this, you know, really, uh, you know, a couple different ones, but like, and it was probably because I was hurting so much because I missed my father. Um, so um, that, for a screenwriter to have that sort of insight into whatever, how your psychology works and how your triggers work can then fuel the choices that you make so they're loaded up. So that you're not just writing, oh, I'm, do -do 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 -do, I'm doing an action film. It's like, yeah, that's that, but it's actually a metaphor for this time in my life where it drove me crazy and broke my heart. And um, because, the movies that we love and the shows that we love are melting our hearts because um, the people creating them are basically sharing their memoirs with us. They're sharing their diaries and most intimate, vulnerable places in their life with archetypes or personified in these characters that are iconic in a way so that I look at Goodfellas and I feel like that's my, me and my friends, and we never did anything with the mob. I grew up on you know, New York, but like way different side of Long Island. And, um, and there was blue collar, there were similarities, but again, like nothing like those guys, and yet exactly like those guys. And that's because Scorsese and Pileggi um, were so specific with the people that they grew up with, and they allowed that to manifest in a movie like Goodfellas, and with such delight and specificity that, um, yeah, it feels like it's my story. You say Andy Dufresne is not the protagonist in The Shawshank Redemption? That's correct. Uh, technically, the helpful way to think about the protagonist is the one who changes the most and has the most agency and impact on the change. So um, in that story, Andy for sure drives the narrative. I mean, he is a freight train of hope all the way through that movie. Um, he hopes right in the beginning, he hopes in the middle, and he hopes at the end, and he has a little bit of a doubt here and there, but for the most part, he's nonstop hope. He dug himself out of that damn prison with like a spoon or something, you know, ridiculous, or I guess a rock hammer. 
Um, Red, the Morgan Freeman character, is, um, I mean, it's not just that he's narrating, but it's also significant that he's narrating because he starts in despair and he says, and they get to the middle and he's kind of picking up that this guy Andy, and they've already been there 15 years at that point, but picking up, he's this guy Andy is all about hope and he goes, hope? You can't hope in here. It'll get you killed in here, right? Um, and that's that part of us that um, considers hope versus despair. Um, and that movie represents, um, Red in that movie is the protagonist and he represents how part of us can realize that um, when we choose hope in no matter what situation, especially when it's really bleak like it is in that film, um, we actually liberate ourselves and we free ourselves to the point where there's a character named Brooks, and I really like that name, Brooks, <laughs> where he gets out and um, the old guy is so, you know, accustomed to that the other people and has so, he kind of is sort of a, a happy-go-lucky character, but like he doesn't have enough hope and optimism to be able to sort of rebuild his life. And so he turns right back to despair and ends up killing himself. Really beautiful turn and counterpoint to this idea of hope versus despair. But no, for sure, um, I would analyze that movie with um, um, Morgan Freeman's character, Red, being the protagonist. Um, and one more thing about that story um, is that when they, um, I believe the way the book uh, ends, which is really wonderful, it ends with um, Morgan Freeman, or not Morgan Freeman, the red character in the book, just saying, I hope, I hope. He's basically learned to hope and you don't know if he ever sees Andy. And to me, that is sort of a deeper, more resonant lesson that like, it's easy to hope if you know you're gonna get it. The rub is, can you hope? Can you believe? Can you be open when you haven't gotten it yet? And you don't know if you're ever gonna get it. And when Red learns to do that, even though he hasn't gotten a reconnection with Andy, to me that really hits hard. So I believe they did that in the actual movie version and um, People were pissed off. They didn't like it, <laughs> so they think they did. They reshot the ending where they actually reunite, and people loved it. So, you know, um, we're in service to the audience, and I think the audience loved seeing hope be overtly rewarded. To them, it landed more deeply. So, when Stephen King wrote the book, it was a novella. Mm -hmm. Was it okay? It's, it's part of a wonderful novella called uh, Different Seasons. Uh, Stand by Me. That movie was it was a movie it was a great story called The Body. That's kind of like the the Rob Reiner film, but a little darker and more interesting. Um, and uh, so that, and then Apt Pupil is another one. There's like four stories, and I think three out of the four were made into um, movies. Wow. And I understand that you said something about because you did a video on your YouTube channel about uh, how the law of attraction powers the Shawshank Redemption, and um, we can put a link to it below here, um, our video. But you feel that the, maybe the title of the movie hurt its success in the initial release? Yeah, yeah, for sure, uh, in my opinion. And one of my writing partners is one of the top marketing minds in Hollywood. Um, so this doesn't mean that I'm always wrong or he's over, but like he's, he's good, so I have a pretty good feel for marketing stuff. And my opinion is that when you have um, an unusual title, like what the hell does that even mean, Shawshank Redemption? Everybody knows what redemption means, but nobody knows what Shawshank means. So um, um, the job of marketing is you're beginning to tell the story. You never want to confuse people. You can intrigue them, and I think that's why they justify a title like that, is that it's intriguing in a way. Um, and in this case, it was, built on IP that maybe people were familiar with and so they were kind of, you know, letting it go. But like the marketing campaign and the title you choose is the beginning of telling the story and the better way to tell the story is clear. This is what my story is. It's a story about this or that, you know. Um, so that's ideal. Um, but, you know, sometimes, you know, the Coen brothers always have kind of funky sounding titles, but like, you know, the Coen brothers movies get sold because of mostly them and their brand and their sort of style, their superpower. So, um, you know, there's certainly exceptions to the rule, but I think if you take 
Shawshank Redemption and you give it a different title, it makes a much bigger splash earlier on. I mean, it made a big splash later because of the reaction, but I think it, um, there were much better titles than that. And I think the book was the book like Ava Gardner or something? Re Rita Hayworth. Rita, okay, and, uh, Rita Hayworth, Hayworth, sorry, the other, other actress, okay, yeah, and then the Shawshank or something. Uh, Rita Hayworth and the Shawshank Redemption. Interesting. Which is okay. fine for a novella, you know, um, I guess. I don't know anything about book marketing. Um, it's maybe no difference at all there, but in movie marketing, there's so much noise. Um, you absolutely will get a bigger audience when you have a great title and it cuts right through the noise in a way that totally beautifully positions the audience for the rest of the story and it's the beginning of the story that you tell. So like a knife, you want it cutting through the noise. When you broke down the Shawshank Redemption in your video, um, you talked about letting go of outcomes and not being attached. If we think of a writer, how should they let go of outcomes or maybe they shouldn't? Maybe that's something that's not, that sh they should not never be too free flowing with letting something go. Well, um, they should always let go. <laughs> should they be completely free flowing? Pretty much, um, but not so like loosey goosey where you're just kind of wandering around aimlessly, right? There's what we want for sort of to cross our next career milestone as quickly as possible. We want to have a clear sense of where we're going and conviction towards it and a joy and an ease and a lack of attachment. And we don't. Ultimately, it's about that process of getting there. The um, it's like the way I talk about it sometimes is that it's a um, where it's a treadmill. You know, um, you're you're jogging on the treadmill and it's a beautiful treadmill. And once you get to one milestone, guess what? There's just another milestone. And then once you get to that second milestone, guess what? There's another milestone, right? So you're already on the damn treadmill. So this idea of I'm going to break in. Well, you write a screenplay today, you've already broken in essentially. Um, are you getting paid for it yet? No, but the paradox is the less attached to it and the more you're there just to serve your audience as powerfully as you can, the quicker you'll cross the milestones that get you to the point where they're paying you lots of money. You also broke down in your video um, victim energy when it comes to the law of attraction mm -hmm. and attracting sort of victim circumstances versus empowerment energy. That's right. How do screenwriters do that? Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, you ever heard of this thing called Twitter? <laughs> so, um, uh, actually, you see both on Twitter. Really wonderful, positive, powerful energy and lots and lots of um, victim choices. I can't make it into Hollywood because of this excuse. I'm to this, I'm to that, I'm to the other. Um, they don't get me. Uh, woe is me, I have no power. It's just, it's really a fascinating choice that um, habit that people have of giving away the power, giving away the power, giving away the power when we have the choice to do the opposite. I'll take the power, I'll take it. I'll, you know, I'm responsible, I can choose. Yes, Hollywood has bias. Yes, some groups are more favored than other groups. Yes, 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 it's all true and you can succeed despite that. How? You go apples to apples. You're trying to do this, you're seeing what's already out there with this, you figure out a way to close that gap, you position yourself as the best person to do the next you know, thing in this genre, the, the person who's gonna write horror in a new way or this in a new way or that in a new way and if you do that, they don't care what you look like, where you came from at all. They, they, you need to deliver the goods and in fact, if you are related to a celebrity or a studio head or whatever and that door is wide open for you, if you don't have the goods, you're not gonna get work either. This idea that nepotism is what fuels all these things, it's BS. I mean, it's a factor, but it's this much of a factor. What's really a factor is delivering the goods. And if you got the goods, they don't care where you came from, they don't care who you are, any type. If you've got the goods, they'll be happy to work with you and they'll try to sell you. And if you have all the connections in the world, 
and you're not delivering the goods, guess where you go? Director jail, writer jail, you get nothing. And that's exactly what happens there. And these ideas that Hollywood's this closed place is BS because of director jail. You know what I mean? It's like, it, you gotta put up. What's true is that you know, you're only as good as your last picture, that sort of thing. I mean, that's, um, that's a negative way to spin it, but that's the truth. I mean, it's like, um, <laughs> The internet makes pretty much anybody you want to get to accessible, you know, one way or another. You know, not everybody, but like most of the people, or if not, not them directly, probably people they know. And if you impress them, but the the truth of it is, um, you know, people just aren't developed enough in their craft to do something that's impressive enough to get to people who can get to people to get it moving, you know. Um, and then, uh, and instead of just going, oh, okay, yeah, I'm on the way, I'm learning, whatever, they go, oh, Hollywood's closed. People, <laughs> um, you know, they don't like my type because of this or that. And um, again, there is bias. I'm not saying there isn't, but it's a tiny part. And when you focus on the bias, you are giving your power away. You are leaking it, and you are distracting yourself from your greatness. And you are. You're just out of alignment from your deeper goal, which is to be in service of your audience, which is all about coming from your power and being there and helping them. And in the Shawshank Redemption, some of the character arcs went from victim attraction, attracting victim-like um, situations to reversals of that with, let's say, the prison warden. Mm -hmm. So he was maybe more empowered at one point, and then because of some things that he did, then it took a reverse turn, whereas with Red, it was, so different character arcs happen. I mean, how much should we be thinking about things like that, the law of attraction in relation to our characters? What are they attracting? Well, we shouldn't think about the law of attraction at all unless um, we like it, unless it speaks to us, unless um, we see real value in it. There's aspects of the way people talk about the law of attraction that are really sort of off-putting to a lot of people. Um, and for good reason, um, and uh, and if your, you know, and if your curiosity stops there, then you shouldn't be thinking about it. Um, it's uh, it's been significantly beneficial for me and for other people I've seen um, put it into practice. Things happen, and it feels good, and it's fun, and it's easier, and it it works. Um, that's my experience. People should have their own experience and see if it works for them. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Um, for Shawshank Redemption, in terms of the victim energy, the, the first thing that came to my mind was that character that um, cracked that first night. So um, so uh, Andy Dufresne comes in, and then that heavier character um, uh, was, um, he cracks. He was He's the one that just, he gets so overwhelmed with his fear that, um, he ends up crying, and I think then the, the the guard actually comes in and then beats him down, and then he dies because of his wounds. So, um, and that from a looked at from a law of attraction perspective was like he brought that on himself. He was so deeply in the habit of giving away his power, not being able to feel the terror that he felt being in this new place, that he um, spiraled to a place where he made things worse, and he made things worse, and he made things worse. Um, to the point where he actually killed him, right? And we all do that sometimes, and we all have the power to do that a little bit less and a little bit less. And when we do it a little bit less so often that we actually almost never do it, we just hold our power and we come from our power more often. Your example about the warden is really interesting. So he starts out clearly with lots of power. Um, and then comes to a point where, but he's he's completely corrupt. So he's doing it, He's not using his power in service of his people. So um, why? What's going on beneath that? He's ultimately, he's got the material power, he's in charge, but he's not, he's not in alignment. He's actually, he's a victim. And he's, he's a victim even though he's technically in charge and he's coming from that victim place as a tyrannical leader. Because the tyrannical leader is not in service of, of his or her people. They are coming from their victim energy. So, um, so when he falls at the end, it is still saying the same theme, that it's always better to find hope. And, and despair and victim energy will always cycle you down to terrible places. Even if you are, and, and that's actually, that's the connection between the two characters, is that you have 
the warden who started out very powerful, but basically was in this energy of victim and lack, and I didn't believe in genuinely serving people, so he had to cheat and steal and lie, and it basically drove him into a place of despair. And that character that came in as the, the fresh fish, the, uh, the guy that cracked under the pressure was the same thing, but he didn't, he, he just, he, his demise happened so quickly because he came, he started from a place of less power, but they both are thematically proving the, 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 the thematic statement of that piece that, um, that when we hope we get good things, when we despair, we get bad things. Or from law of attraction language, when we are open to our power, um, or we, sorry, sorry, the negative part, when we are sort of bringing in victim energy or lack energy or that sort of thing, it leads to despair. When we bring in our power and our flow and our ease and our belief and our hope and our patience, it leads to triumph. Should, so just the way people sort of use the hero's journey yeah. to, to, as a backdrop against their story, if someone is open to the law of attraction and, and in whatever woo-woo parts scare maybe some people, <laughs> others are open to, um, what, what templates can they apply to their story with the law of attraction? Geez, um, I don't know if I would call it a template. It's like um, my understanding of law of attraction there's been, you know, people talking about this probably for thousands of years in one way or another. But in the 20th century, there was some, you know, people writing about it sort of the turn of the century. And then in the last, I don't know, 20, 30 years, there's been other people writing books about it. There was that movie, The Secret, that, that was, you know, t touching on it. And, um, but it's like, uh, I don't know. I mean, it's, yeah, you know, it's more of a, it's, it's the tool that, screenwriters can take from it is more of a mindset approach. It's like, look, the doors are going to close in your career for sure. How do you want to respond to that? In a way where you're like, oh no, the door closed, blah, 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 that's terrible. Oh, I didn't get into this, you know, screenplay competition, or oh, this person didn't buy my script, or whatever it is. There's, a, oh, this person's not returning my phone call. <laughs> um, uh, you have a choice in how you can respond to that. And, um, and when you choose to respond to that from your inner sovereign energy as a king or a queen saying, I reached out to another kingdom and it didn't work out, fine, I'll reach out to another kingdom and then I'll reach out to another kingdom and then I'll reach out, because you know why? That's who I am. I am a king and I reach out to other kingdoms and I do business when I find my kindred spirits and that's just it because this is a treadmill and I'm just in it to be here and to do things. And yes, at some point I'll find the right person and we can marry our kingdoms together and do something amazing. And until that point, who cares? Because I'm showing up as me and I'm just doing it. 